Heine P, Anin Buju, good morning. Uh, Dr. Jesse Conaway here welcoming you in to our fourth almost annual cultural responsiveness training for working with tribes. Uh, this is sponsored by the Nelson Institute. I'm representing uh, the Nelson Institute today and also uh, Earth Partnership of UW, both of UW-Madison. Um, so wanna greet each of you and, and say thank you uh, for joining in. Uh, we're looking forward to our day. We have um, our, I'm, So Alessandra, President White Eagle saying that he's having uh, technical difficulties joining in. So he'll be here soon. Yeah, I'm in contact with him now. We'll get oh, him good. Okay, good. Good folks. Well, um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Representative Brinegar, who's uh, joining us um, from Ho Chunk Nation, and uh, we are going to go into our welcome right now, but I'll just say that much so far. Um, and we have another, we have uh, President White Eagle joining in as well. Um, Representative Brinegar, I'd like to turn it over to you and um, please uh, please introduce yourself and um, and uh, Pete Nikiki for joining us. We bumped you up on the agenda. All right. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, Corrine, I Kareen, Karen, thank you for joining me outside. It's a beautiful day out. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this meeting uh, out of Madison. Madison in our culture, we call in our tribe, we call it Dejo. Um, thank you for taking a few hours this morning to learn a little bit about native populations. Three hours isn't nearly enough to cover the breadth of issues that face Native American people across the country, much less discuss the barriers that Native students and faculty have, have overcome just to walk through the doors of any university. I'm sure most of you heard stories about removals and treaties. Some of you have heard about the United States policy of pacification through intoxication and forced sterilization. You may have read about Native people, most of all, written through the lens of a non-Native. So you don't get any, so you don't get the cultural context. For example, many writings during our early period of con colonialization reference the great white father, meaning the president of the United States. This reference comes from the philosophy that our tribal chiefs take on the role similar to that of the father, the leader. So um, once again, welcome. There's a lot in Madison. Um, we. We're very thankful to the university for including the nation in a lot of different activities on the campus and respecting what we had in that day job area with our burial mounds and everything that moves forward. And um, I know some of you had read about the canoes coming out of the lake down there. It's been huge, huge impact for us. So thank you. I hope you guys have a good day and learn a lot on this. Thanks. And welcome to Ho-Chunk Country. <laughs> thank you, Representative Brinegar. Appreciate that. And um, yeah, and also uh, uh, and also appreciate the, the Ho-Chunk Nation dugout that was on the water uh, this summer. I was uh, I paddled through Day Jope with Bill Quackenbush and uh, and other Ho Chunks for the for the dugout journey in the end of June. So I was a support boat that week. So thank you, thanks for bringing that up. Okay, folks. So um, I will, as our other uh, folks are joining in to uh, start off our morning, I'm going to walk through our agenda quickly, and then we'll get going. We've got a lot to do today. So, um, Representative Brinegar, you're welcome to uh, hang in with us for as long as you're able to, and Pina Gigi for uh, getting us started. Appreciate you joining in, sir. Um, Megan, I see you. Can you see my screen, Megan, with my with the agenda? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> 
I know uh, President White Eagle is looking to join in, so we'll patch him in here as we're able to. Um, I'll just walk through uh, our, our lineup for the morning. Um, and so we're welcoming in uh, Dr. Megan Bang of uh, Northwestern University, the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. Um, so uh, thank you, Megan Bang, for joining. We'll go to you shortly. We wanna <clears throat> leave uh, breaks for um, Q&A and discussion between each of our sessions. So we'll have that built in. So make sure, uh, so participants, um, we do wanna hear from you. So make sure that you're uh, joining in for those uh, Q&A and discussion. Um, we, for, for these trainings, we always um, do an, uh, an education strand focusing on uh, serving our Indigenous students uh, more effectively. And so we'll be continuing with that effort this morning. Um, and we are joined by the Ho-Chunk Nation Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, Mr. Bill Quackenbush, sharing uh, perspectives on courses that he's worked, um, worked on through UW-Madison. And then also uh, Cheryl Bauer Armstrong and Maria Moreno of Earth Partnership, <laughs> Indigenous Arts and Sciences. We want to um, also build in some time for, uh, for us to get to know each other, who's in the room, who's in the Zoom room, and do some uh, networking around uh, project planning, grant seeking, et cetera. So we'll uh, leave some time for speed networking as well. And uh, <clears throat> Alessandra will be helping to facilitate that. Thank you, Alessandra. And then that's, um, that's our morning. So I'll stop sharing here. <clears throat> We, um, one last note on logistics, thank you for your attention, folks, um, is that we, we didn't build in any breaks, so just take breaks as you need to do so. And um, Alessandra, is there anything else that we wanna share at this time before we go to? <clears throat> nope, I think that's it. I think we're going, uh... Okay. Good to go ahead and get started with the agenda. I'm still working with uh, President White Eagles to try to get him on. Okay, that sounds good. <clears throat> so um, we're we're working with uh, our other speaker this morning to join in. But in the meantime, um, let's get started. Um, Dr. Bang, I see that you're here with us. Um, Miigwech for joining in a little bit early. I know you're busy. So I think as Alessandra is working with President White Eagle, if, if, if it's okay to go to you right away, is that okay? Okay, great. So um, I would like to uh, participants, colleagues, friends, compadres, uh, please join me in welcoming in uh, Dr. Megan Bang, who's joining in from Northwestern. And um, Dr. Bang, I'll just ask you uh, to introduce yourself how, how you want to, and I'll just say that much so far. But um, it's been good getting to know you a little bit over the years through um, your advisorship to Indigenous Arts and Sciences um, of Earth Partnership, So, and also through Patty Lowe my uh, former advisor. So Miigwech for joining in and I'll turn the mic over to you. Awesome. Buju, Badaba Nikwe, Dijin Kas, Nishinaabe Kwe, Gudun Undadem, Gitigan Zabing, Minwa Gule Bay, Ngamig, Minwa Chicago. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Megan. Um, I'm Ojibwe and Italian descent. Um, I'm a third generation urban dwelling person. Um, and just really glad to be here. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen right now. Um, I, um, I also just wanna say thanks for asking me to come talk uh, about this. This is a different talk than I've had the honor of giving, um, partly because I have a new role, um, at least for a moment, 
um, as the director for, of the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. Um, Patty um, was kind of our, um, she was our founding director of the center and we're um, both happy that she is, we got to steal her from you and <laughs> that she really is going emeritus now. Um, but um, it's kind of my honor to step into that role. Um, I'm also just, I'll say, um, I'm a professor of education in the School of Education and Social Policy. Um, and um, I'm a mom and an auntie and a grandma uh, and a sister and a cousin, um, former early childhood teacher, middle school teacher. I continue to teach directly high school students annually, as well as work with kiddos. Um, what you should get from that is I really like kids and adults make me nervous. Um, so we'll see how this goes, um, but that's kind of what I do. Um, I, I'm gonna dive in because I'm excited to share with you all and hope that this is helpful today. Um, and um, I'm really gonna try to share a little bit about where we are as Northwestern. Um, and then dive a little bit, I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time um, on kind of what that means for me as an individual faculty member, but I'm mostly gonna to try to um, talk a little bit about um, where we are as a university. Um, I should also say I'm a graduate of Northwestern. So one thing that I always have to own is, I don't know if you all noticed this, but um, sometimes graduate students have like the deepest critiques of their alma maters for a while. So I'm always trying to rebuild that relationship here a little bit, right? Um, but they got me back. So um, ooh, that's not what I meant to do. Um, so, uh, all right, so um, I, I wanna start um, just uh, making sure people know a little bit about Northwestern. So um, Northwestern sits in the original homelands of the Council of the Three Fires. Here's our kind of institutional um, land acknowledgement. Um, what I um, really like to tell people um, is that uh, as a faculty member, I think about that I'm on my original territories, um, even if they're currently known as Chicago or Evanston or some other name. I think the other thing to know about Northwestern and how it is that the things I'm about to share with you came to be is understanding our own institutional histories. So Northwestern um, was founded by John Evans. Um, and really, um, when I was a graduate student, uh, there were no Native faculty on our campus. Um, there were only three other Native students at the time that we knew each other. Um, and there were no, there was just nothing. <laughs> there was really nothing. Um, and partly what happened um, is uh, that people started very slowly to recognize like Northwestern uh, had some issues. So. For those of you who may not know, um, John Evans was the governor of the Colorado Territories. And um, while Northwestern didn't find him entirely culpable, um, he was the governor during the Sand Creek Massacre. Um, and he built his, we his wealth on opening up territories to the West at, for railroads and accumulating tons of personal wealth in that process as that governor. Um, and Northwestern and the town of Evanston were named after him. Um, so for us, while we both do a land acknowledgement, we also recognize that we um, are at an institution that um, is, is, is actually indebted to many indigenous peoples and in particular the Cheyenne and Arapaho peoples. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time actually talking about this, but partly what, what you see up here is this report of the John Evans Study Committee from 2014. So we're eight years in to the university actually commissioning a report and deciding to think a little bit about what is our institutional history and responsibility and how are we gonna start making that official beyond a kind of land recognition, um, which is, is good, but not uh, sufficient um, when this is the kind of history. So um, here's what I'm gonna try to do today. I was trying to come up with a good image that was like a metaphor. So you're kind of getting me with multiple hats on from multiple perspectives, trying to think about complex systems and what it means to kind of transform tribal university partners. Um, and, and I'm also an educator and I'm a full professor. So I sometimes feel like I get to say what I want for less consequence than junior professors. So I'm gonna to try to do that today a little bit too. Um, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the broad NU structure, but then really sink into what and why is CNAIR because I think it's probably important as an institution to hear about what's it look like to set up infrastructures beyond like kind of individual departments or individual scholars doing cool work. Um, and then I'm gonna do a little bit of like, okay, so how do I feel about this as a, as a individual scholar? 
Um, okay, so here's the Here's the thing is we're in these really interesting times as universities where we're trying to make systemic change, I would argue, not just at universities, but the question is from what perspective and what I want to really start with today is to say um, that I would really argue that Northwestern and all universities need to be thinking about how are we engaging in efforts that contrib contribute to indigenous thriving, and that has to mean, in my view, upholding sovereignty and self-determination. That can include diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice efforts. But if they start with DEIJ, -E um, they can really, those efforts can really perpetuate harm to Native people, even if unintended. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and sometimes, you know, my graduate students joke that um, diversity, equity, inclusion efforts can be where justice goes to die. So, so I really think like thinking about our core approaches and our foundations and assumptions are really important because I think people are genuinely making efforts, but we need work about how we're doing the work and from what kind of paradigms and assumptions. So why is it that DEIJ could potentially be a problem um, for indigenous people in particular? Um, one reason is they often fail to really reckon with the histories, dynamics, and the conceptual foundations and practices that have created kind of the present and continuing the present, and they continue to structure the present, right? So sometimes we think about injustice as like a past thing. It's not really still happening. Um, and we don't really understand the foundations of what that, what those, and we just heard some, um, which I really appreciated about the introduction um, from, from our Ho-Chunk leaders. Um, so, but that real reckoning with understanding those things is often not what DEIJ is up to. At Northwestern, I can give you an example. Indigenous peoples weren't present in those efforts until about five years ago. If you're not including indigenous peoples in your justice efforts in the United States, you might not be dealing with real history, right? So that's an example. Um, I also think what's really important to understand is that forced inclusion, also known as assimilation, also known as policies to eradicate indigenous peoples, cultures, our histories, our knowledge systems, has been a key policy and approach to education since founding. So one of the big strategies that we have really thought about that I think is really important is that often universities wanna increase the numbers of students and faculty and staff from underrepresented groups. That means pathways to the universities and those pathways can be assimilative even if it's an inclusion paradigm. So we really need to have, have to think about how are we building the university so that inclusion isn't another name for assimilation, okay? Um, and that's that's hard work, right? And I'm not suggesting that I don't want lots of Native people who are well-trained in multiple knowledge systems, right? That's not the point. But the trouble is, and it, one of the sort of middle-class fallacies of their, our education systems is that kiddos from communities that are struggling with poverty or inequality want a better life. And a better life looks like some migration away from their homes and their communities that are rough towards middle-class American life. That is not an indigenous dream for education, <laughs> right? Most of us want our kids to come home to our communities and contribute to our peoples. That doesn't mean you can't contribute to other things too, but I'm just getting at there's a core construct that usually undergirds the DEIJ -E -E paradigms that have failed to recognize the kind of assumptions about why getting higher ed is such a good thing. The other thing that happens, and I started to say that they're typically derived from racial justice lenses, not a sovereignty and self-determination lens, and applying a racialized lens to indigenous peoples is actually part of our ongoing harm and one of our core challenges, I would argue, around the difference between understanding race and political status. Um, not that native people aren't racist too, but we're not only raced. There is this paradigm of sovereignty, culture beyond kind of racialization and those categories. Um, the other thing that often happens in DEIJ efforts is that they're institutionally centered um, with kind of targeted efforts and not always community engaged or systematically approached. Um, and 
Well, I, I am a fan of institutional change, but I do think that again, if we're locating change at the university and then asking for labor from communities who have not been well served to get the institution to transform without showing a little reciprocity, that theory of change leads to potential more harm. So again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting anyone actually intends to do this. I just think we jump into DEIJ efforts without having really done that reckoning that I was talking about. Um, the last thing that I wanna say about why this is a problem is that um, often universities think they're doing us a favor by including us and assume that we'll just um, kind of be a new representation rather than lead change, be at the cutting edge. Um, and so, so you can kind of see universities treat indigenous faculty, indigenous focused projects as kind of inclusion projects, not the intellectual edges of innovation um, in all kinds of ways. Um, and I, I think that that becomes another way that unintentionally we kind of normalize particular approaches and the inclusion part actually withholds all kinds of potential transformations. So there's my worries. I'm gonna give you a couple of concrete examples about why this is particularly challenging, challenging in the United States. And for those of you who, know who, I, talk, who I give talks about my own work, I always show the slide <laughs> um, because it does work, I think, for people. So the US is so built on a kind of historicized image of indigenous peoples and our absence, most people have no idea about this. So, and this is part of the problem with seeing indigenous peoples as a racial category and not a, a, a political category or a kind of nation state, a nation uh, category. So the purple in this map are indigenous peoples and territories globally, meaning indigenous peoples are multiracial. And part of the point about this is that when we think about big issues like climate change, a quarter of all land is still in indigenous hands and 80% of the world's biodiversity is in our territories. If ecological collapse and needing to have functional ecosystems is actually a major challenge of the next hundred years, indigenous peoples in our territories are probably the key given that that's where the majority of biodiversity is. We're gonna have to lead or else what's gonna happen is people are gonna go and invade our territories again and steal our natural resources again. So it's one example. Another example, and most people in the United States are shocked by these numbers and have no idea because it's not present in education. Another example, and I'll just say this was recently um, adopted and I'm gonna be a little cute about this, but you know, the US was like the last to support the UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights. There are reasons, right, in a US context that um, there has been a, there has been systemic long-term efforts to refuse our sovereignty. The ICWA cases are an example of it playing out right the second. VAWA is another example. It is on the political ballot in the United States. And Stephanie Freiberg does work to show that both the far right and the far left equally are unlikely to support indigenous sovereignty in the United States. So part of the reason I'm saying that is that it's important to recognize that we don't necessarily fit nicely into kind of the schemas that people develop. I also think that this is the one that was just adopted a couple of days ago. And I love to show this one to univers uh, uh, universities now. So according to the UN, capital letters for indigenous and in official documents is now the appropriate way to show respect. So for all of you that are professors and get caught up on grammar about whether it's capital I or little I, you can now go to a UN report that says you should be using a capital I. <laughs> But the other ones that are really important to understand here is, right, that there is a kind of global recognition that is not commonplace in the United States for things like the importance of our languages, the protection of indigenous women as kind of central to what is necessary, all kinds of ways of constructing policy that protects indigenous lands and peoples that are global efforts Whereas in the United States, most indigenous nations have to fight like hell to do any of those things. So the US is really out of step with a lot of global efforts around, around indigenous peoples. Okay, so, so what's this mean? This is my big, my big spiel. Um, what's this mean? 
um, for what a shift can look like in a university system. So um, I, I, I think what we've really tried to do at Northwestern, and we're not perfect, just to, so you know, like we're in deep motion, always trying to figure it out. Our efforts are not very old. But rather than like, what can we do for Native American and Indigenous students and faculty to make them fit and be successful here? We've been trying to ask the question, what changes do we as an institution have to make to become a place Indigenous communities trust? How can we become good responsible partners? How can we be in good relations, right? So what are the conditions at the university that would mean Indigenous students, faculty, staff would thrive and Indigenous nations would wanna work with us? Um, so, so that's a different paradigm, right? And that's the DEIJ paradigm, I would argue towards a different kind of orientation to the questions. Okay, so how are we actually doing about this? So I just wanna give everyone an, an understanding of where we are. The 2013 report was commissioned that I showed you at the beginning. It came out in 2015, is like the first thing that came from it that we would start an indigenous research initiative, um, which in 2016 became CNAIR with our first grant from Mellon. So we're six years old, right? No efforts at the university, the university until 2014, none. Um, so we're not very old in these things. Um, the CNAIR really began in the fall of 2017. So really we're only five years in and had a pandemic in the middle of it. Um, we opened up a new minor in 2020 um, and we just received a renewal grant for the center. And what I'm gonna share with you mostly today is a little bit the sort of high level, like what have we put in place at the university and why, and then focus a little bit on, on CNAIR. Um, so, so I know you can't read this, so don't try to, but it's our, it's our org chart. Um, and here's what I wanted you to know. So our core, our current core institutional structures is that we have an advisory board to the president. We have staff in the office of the provost. Um, we have um, core leadership in um, student affairs, in admissions. Um, and then we have the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research, which um, is a cross university center, even though it's housed in one school, at least until next fall, where it will be housed in the office of the provost. Um, and then we have what we call a strategic development team that sort of, uh, it interfaces with the advisory board, but it's its own entity. Those are kind of institutionally, we went after the key pieces. There's all kinds of things that we're continuing to push. Like, frankly, we don't have housing. No one's really on the housing yet, um, but we've been sort of, that's how we started. And part of what I wanted to say about this is to recognize we knew we needed people in all of the core functions of the university, because if we were after actually transforming the university, you couldn't have it located in only one place. We all meet together and work together but we knew we needed to have um, kind of people doing the work in each of the major areas of the university. We have a series of ongoing, like here's the problems, this is what else we need. So for example, we're really pushing hard to get a vice provost of indigenous initiatives that actually look, sees over everything. Um, we also have a position that is really about a tribal liaison, which we think is really important. That person is now housed under senior. I'm not sure that that's the right organizational structure. We don't currently have anyone in the graduate school, and that's for us matters because all graduate students are admitted there. And we do not have faculty represented across all the schools at Northwestern. So we have an initiative to have at least one indigenous faculty member in all disciplines, at least the major disciplines. Um, and we're far from that right now. Um, in fact, when Patty retires, I'll be the only tenured native faculty at Northwestern. Um, we have a few junior folks that are coming up but partly why I'm saying this to you is that if we were serious about these things, like those are the material realities, we can talk a good game, but are you actually making, making things real in that way? So I, I'm not gonna say much more about that. If people have questions, I'm happy to talk about it, but I'm gonna move to CNR, which is actually my job um, here um, and tell you a little bit about this center. So our mission um, is really Northwestern's primary institutional space um, dedicated to advancing scholarship, teaching, learning, and artistic or cultural practices related to Native and Indigenous peoples. Um, and really what we were after was creating a center um, that was the hub for kind of multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary collaborative work um, that was informed by and responsive to or in partnership with Native and Indigenous communities, organizations, nations. 
Um, and really to think about it as kind of an intellectual center that is, is based in indigenous methodologies and indigenous questions and indigenous paradigms that help support scholars kind of navigating the multiplicities that they have to do. So that's really what our, our mission is. And I can say a lot before about that, but I thought I would give a little bit of flesh about this. Um, just so you kind of know where we are. We, we actually, um, own, we have three full-time staff. We have an associate director, Pam Silas, who does really a lot of the tribal partnerships. Um, I think, yeah, so she's the director. And, and to be honest, we've been co-directors for a while. Um, and so it's not, it's a pretty flat organization. Um, we have an, a research administrator because we're really trying to build out partnerships around research infrastructure, which I'll say more about. And then we have an advisory council and a whole bunch of affiliated faculty. Um, and then work study students, graduate students, TAs, that sort of thing. Um, what are our research hubs? Um, so when we started, it was around global indigeneities, nationhood law and governance, environments, health and social welfare, and communities, culture, and activism. And it's a, really a way for us to organize this. Um, these are uh, evolving, and this is me trying to be funny, but I got hired and I was like, so our research hubs aren't interested in education. That probably was a mess if you wanted me to be the director of the of CNAIR, that's probably not how we should think about it. So just to say, like, I think that our center of gravity about CNAIR is not so much that we've identified the topics that will forever in perpetuity drive our research, but it's the how and what of doing scholarship and partnering with tribal communities is at the center. And that our, our foci definitely are after kind of, um, mobilizing what are we well positioned to help with, but but they're not set in stone. So how do we think about this? Um, um, so there's really four kinds of things. We think about relationships, presence, people, and knowledge, um, and how we do that. I'm not gonna spend tons of time on each of these, but I just wanna give you a kind of flavor about them. So our people, um, we have 38, maybe 44 senior NU affiliates. They have to renew every couple of years. But generally, our core, our core people are the advisory board, which is both within and outside of Northwestern, our core school and in interdisciplinary collaboration, so affiliated faculty, students, and staff, and then community partners. And I'll just give you a sense that we map. Um, you again should not read this, but what you should see here is that we're really deliberate about forming strategic partnerships with all the major hubs in the university and ensuring that we have some memorandums of partnership and projects that are, are, are there. And it's a way that we've sort of looked at what are we doing well? And what you might notice on the left is these light purple boxes. That is partners within Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. And one of the things uh, why we're moving to be a URIC, which is a university research center of excellence um, that is across and not within one college is because what ha is happening that you can see here is that we're located in Weinberg and the intellectual work we're doing is being pulled by Weinberg um, affiliates more than others. Now that's not a bad thing. They all do fabulous work, but um, not all nations need College of Arts and Sciences partnerships, right? And so our structure right now is privileging particular disciplines and domains over others. And we're trying to course correct that a little bit. Um, I guess part of what I wanted to really get at is um, this work of forming partnerships is relational work. Um, you can't do this easily. There isn't simple checklists or navigating how to roadmaps, but there are structures that help maintain relations. Meaning there actually has to be people whose job it is to do that. Or else what we ask is for a bunch of people to do a lot of labor that isn't valued and nor is it sustainable. Um, and so we are always thinking about that piece. Um, we have tons of partners. I just wanna say we partner from everything from tribes to folks like the Michigan Tribal Ed Department. So it couldn't be, be um, uh, larger organizations that are confederations of tribes, right? Um, to nonprofit organizations like NAJA, to really individualized organizations like the American Indian Center of Chicago. Um, when we think about partnerships in this relational work, we're not targeting particular kinds of partners. It's not how we do it really. Um, but we are trying to think about structures that support that range of kinds of relationships and partnerships. Um, 
I do think it's probably important for everyone to understand that part of our work is thinking about presence. And I have argued that visibility isn't the right word because visibility can, we are actually hyper visible, just not on our terms. Um, and so presence is really about trying to say that we are always focused on supporting the presence of indigenous peoples in the world and brag on Doug Keel um, for a minute, who is an historian, a remarkable historian, but is also engaged in remarkable policy making. Um, right, he was an expert witness in the case of Oneida Nation versus the village of Hobart, which many of you might know about. But he also just this year um, provided remarkable testimony to the Committee on Natural Resources as an historian. So our scholars are kind of working on presence in the in the world all the time. We are always thinking about our presence on campus. Patty Lowe did this brilliant indigenous tour of Northwestern that sort of is embedded now and that new students coming in do it, that when we have um, parent weekend, we set this up. But the point is we're trying to infrastructure presence at Northwestern and doing cool things like making birch bark canoe and revitalizing those traditions. So, and then there's presence in communities. So presence in the world, presence on campus, presence in communities is kind of the way that we think about this. Um, and that is often through our projects or we embed it in our teaching. Um, as kind of um, how are we doing service learning trips and how are those those trips in service to communities um, or research projects that are actually things like help us design new educational programs. Um, our knowledge piece is that we're always trying to develop research projects um, that that tribes are at the center of right that indigenous communities get to ask the questions generate and then we put together kind of teams of expertise that move those agendas we have a lovely new project um, uh, um, that is in partnership with Glyphwick around um, monoman and kind of climate change impacts um, as an example we do everything from art to really remarkable engineering um, to uh, there's Beth Redbird is um, a junior scholar, sociologist, um, native woman who is doing really interesting work around tribal constitutions and the analysis. She has the biggest database of tribal constitutions anywhere we think um, and really trying to study how tribal constitutions have been impacted and restructured and looking at broad, broad patterns across tribes that not all tribes have an opportunity to see how the feds are managing um, tribal constitutional reform um, over time. So it's really lovely and working with the School of Law to do that. Um, I think the other thing to hear about our projects is that we um, are always thinking about infrastructuring knowledge um, both for students, but also for faculty and staff. Um, so we run an Indigenous Methods Brown Bag series, um, partly as a way to expand people's understanding of Indigenous methods. So we feature lots of folks across different disciplines that are engaged in aspects of Indigenous methodologies. Sometimes we've noticed that in the academy, Indigenous methods are sort of claimed and sort of cursorily attended to. And so we've really been trying to build that knowledge base. Um, and this is just examples. Amanda Tachini came um, and we're continuing um, to do that both internally, um, meaning that we highlight scholars within the university, but we also bring people outside. Um, we've built a minor. I can say lots of things about that. Um, we're moving towards a major and we're in the middle of proposing a new graduate program. So we're trying to create infrastructure programs um, across, the, across the university. The other thing that Senior does is we um, provide fellowships for supporting research. So it's it's um, processes of grant making is complicated, and there are lots of disciplines that don't access don't have access to lots of resources. I'm not telling you anything you all don't know, but Senior wanted to be deliberate about figuring out how to support scholarship that might not be the shiniest thing for every Western Foundation to support immediately. So we've really been deliberate about trying to infrastructure kind of an intermediary role of supporting fellows doing interesting work. So we give fellowships to communities, to community members. You don't have to be a Northwestern student or faculty member to get these fellowships. Um, and faculty, graduate students and undergraduate students. And partly what I probably think I left out is we have um, both visiting elders and visiting artists every year that we appoint as kind of faculty members um, at CNAIR as a way to kind of disrupt some of the normative powered degreed requirements of universities. 
Um, and then I wanna just say a couple of things about institutional development, because I think this is a big one. Um, we are developing partnerships with our institutional review board office. Um, there have been lots of IRB shifts um, that have been in motion, some of which came from the federal level around health research that have major consequences for lots of other disciplines that at least at our university are just beginning to really show themselves, but they're everywhere. Um, and as we've increased our visibility and interest on in universities, it's also meant that um, some faculty with good intentions have proposed crappy research, quite frankly. <laughs> um, and we had no um, kind of infrastructure to support that or, and our IRB office really didn't know anything about tribal IRB or what it looked like to be in good ethical relation, research relations. So we're really working on kind of PI training materials and helping the IRB office think about criteria for review. I'm saying that one because I really think all universities really should have this infrastructure. It's like an easy, well, it's not an easy one to do, but it's an easy, very high impact potential activity to do. But we do lots of other things. So um, um, we're, you know, there's ways in which we've been workshopping kind of knowledge learning at the institutional level, whether it's ongoing faculty and staff workshops or the indigenous tour, we're developing outdoor learning environments in a number of ways. My favorite is that we run an annual Sugarbush camp on Northwestern's campus because we have enough maples to actually do some good stuff and teach a class. But we're trying always to actually transform our, our campus um, in ways that aren't um, always obvious. Okay. Um, if I take five, 10 more minutes, is that, I, I think I'm not totally over, right? I think I have 40 or 45 minutes, Jesse. Yes. Yeah, you're, yes, you're doing, that's just fine for a time. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of try to spend those last time for me talking, and then hopefully we can have lots of dialogue talking about this from kind of my faculty hat. Um, and I really just want to say that I, I think that this is always a question. So I started out like we should be thinking as an institution, but I also think that there's this question, what changes do we as academics have to make to become people and professionals and indigenous communities trust. Um, and that we have kind of ethical responsibilities to ask how can we become good responsible partners and be in good relations. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit, I'm going to try to give you a peek into like what's my actual research um, and then end a little bit about like the complications of what it means to be in good relations to do this kind of work. Um, so as an educator, what I'm really after is um, what's education, what should it be, and um, given that we're living in times of the Anthropocene and how is it that education might cultivate just, culturally thriving and sustainable communities. Now, obviously I mean that for indigenous communities, but as a scholar, I actually don't mean it only for indigenous communities. So I engage in lots of work that is focused only on tribal communities, but I also work with schools and communities broadly, both in the United States and um, internationally. Um, and I think a lot about, um, so what does that mean about the forms of education that we need? And I study fundamental understandings of human learning, things like cognition, reasoning, and decision-making, um, as well as how those things are shaped and impacted by kind of contexts like power history um, and specific disciplinary lenses. Um, so there's lots to say about that. I will tell you how I've done that is a really, um, was trained as a learning scientist and a cognitive scientist. So I think a lot about core cognitive models of human relationships with the natural world. All of my work is always asking questions about how does this, what, what I call nature culture relations, but our fundamental construals about the natural world and understandings about the natural world and our relations with the natural world as human people, kind of shaping human activity, our knowledge systems and values, how things like power and history are playing out. Um, and as a learning scientist and a cognitive scientist, um, those are deep fields in understanding human beings and human mind, um, but they're centrally configured in learning environments. And I just wanna pull the thread through. Apart from models have kind of been foundational in Western knowledge systems and the development of our school systems. We pull children from their families and the land and put them inside buildings for the majority of their days. At that very base structure, we're doing this. It's bad for native children, I would argue it's bad for all of us. There's really interesting health research to demonstrate that's happening. Um, so just to say that's kind of what I'm always after. And this model on the right 
um, depending upon your knowledge organization and human beings placed in that knowledge organization has massive impacts about how you reason. Um, so that's kind of what I've been up to. Pragmatically, what that has meant is that I've been after kind of trying to understand what land and water based education could actually look like rather than institutional based education or building based education. Um, and um, this is from Vine Deloria and um, Leanne Simpson. But part of the point about that is that I'm after not just a what education, an epistemic education, sort of teaching about Indigenous peoples, but what it means to actually regenerate the conditions for indigenous ways of knowing and being in the world. And, and Vine and Leanne talk about that we should be concerned with recreating the conditions with, within, within which um, indigenous education and learning occurred, not merely the content of the practice itself. So that's what I'm up to. I have been doing this um, the, over long periods of time, just to give an example. Um, and I, I guess I'll say, so none of what I do is like mine. It's, it's that I've been building learning environments, studying them and asking questions in partnership with communities since I got my first research grant, which was in 2001. Um, and we've continued to do this kind of what I would call participatory processes um, towards um, really trying to think about, this is often how I think about it, is what does it mean to create learning that's based in relationality, responsibility, and kin relations? Um, so I, I'm gonna try to say a little bit about methods and how I do that. And maybe this will be helpful to say like, okay, but really how do you do this? So typically I tell people I kind of do three different kinds of scholarship. One community-based design research of learning environments. I continue to do foundational cognitive studies that look, um, that I would argue actually look pretty sort of Western traditional, except for that I'm always after demonstrating how universalisms have been claimed in probably problematic ways. So I, those are kind of quant, quant driven experimental studies. Um, and then I do a lot of ethnographies of sort of studies of everyday practice in communities to try to understand lots of things. Um, and then it turns out over time, which everyone probably knows is I end up, you end up as an academic doing all kind of program and policy development too. So developing teacher ed, uh, both programs and legislation in Washington state, op introducing some next week in Illinois. Um, I've been building out programs, partnered with the University of Minnesota right now to build out an Ojibwe PhD program for language speakers. Um, so I, I kind of feel like it's important that all of us keep saying like, oh yeah, it's not just our scholarship we're up to um, and that those have really important impacts. Um, but I wanna say a little bit about why I do community-based design research and it as a method is kind of cultivating educational determination. I started here a little bit. Um, but what I want to say about this is that when we design learning environments, whether it's a university or CNAIR or my particular class or a school system, there are a bunch of decisions being made to balance both goals and constraints about how a design process will actually happen. What are the actual practices? What needs and opportunities are being identified? And what's the resulting form that design will take? And so as a design-based researcher, taking seriously that processes of design are as important and create the conditions for outcomes is, is partly what I've been up to for a long time and our field does. And so what does that meant? Oh, sorry, the, um, I don't know why this is badly, um, whatever. Um, so what we've been after is just saying, um, right, like traditionally designer researcher have not meant all of the different roles in our communities. Um, and so we've really been deliberate about creating partnerships where there's lots of perspective. And one of the things I want you to hear about this is there isn't a single Indian that can tell you about all Indian things, <laughs> not how things work, right? And so we've been really deliberate about making sure we recognize the multiplicity of roles in communities to contribute to the building of educational environments. Certainly we elevate and honor elders and leaders, but parents, other community members, children themselves are also important perspectives in developing things. And so we're really deliberate about that. When we design, we think about all kinds of practices. These are kind of current ones that I have going with different communities. Um, you don't need to make sense of all of these. You can ask me about them if you want to, but the point is, is we're really deliberate. We don't just sit at meetings on Zoom or in a building at Northwestern to make decisions. We actually do things in the world together, reflect on them and think about their implications um, for what we're trying to make together. And here's why this becomes important. 
for many reasons. But part of what we've also been after over time is our methods help create pathways for new possibilities for community members in all kinds of ways. So what you'll see here is you have community members who become designers and researchers, and then you end up seeing community members who also regenerate roles into being the teachers and implementers and scholars, right? And for us, part of the problem is, is that um, if anyone's seen any teacher ed statistics, Native people are horrifically underrepresented in the teaching field. We have a real dearth of Indigenous educators. And I often say to people, can you imagine that if all schools in the United States, if 99% of our teachers were from Germany or Mexico or Japan, we all probably would be like, wait, what? Why are our kids being educated almost in totality from people who are not from our communities? Not to say that it would even be they had bad intentions. It's just structurally, that's a funky dynamic. Um, and so we've been really after what are processes that can also support the development of educators and regenerating kind of routine educators in our communities too. And our, our very methodological structure and how we do research has helped do that. So I said that already. Here's what I think is really important about um, kind of where I'm always sitting about this in education and why this method of partnership um, opens up kind of new intellectual questions all the time. So we've been after, we didn't always say this in the beginning, but the last few years, what we've come to is like, oh yeah, we're after what we've been calling kind of an idea of pedagogical sovereignty, not just deciding what gets taught, but how it gets taught for real. Um, and doing that in a way that helps us actually unearth and regenerate our own pedagogical traditions. It's really inspired by some of Scott Lyon's work that talks about that often what happens is that we get some epistemic ground, the content of what, but not the how. And Scott argues that it requires a radical rethinking of how, of how and what we teach, not just what we teach. Um, so I think about that a lot. Um, and this goes back to Deloria's point. If all we're doing is transforming what's taught inside buildings where kids sit for seven or eight hours a day, we're probably got some space to still move to get to indigenous models of education, right? So really kind of um, sinking in there. Okay, I'm gonna put that down and here's what I wanna say. So I just told you I had three major strands of work plus all this policy and practice work. And really what you need to know, it's more like 52 strands of work. And I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges, both personally, and it feels really important as I mentor junior faculty, is that the sets of, of responsibilities to be in good relations um, is, probably is, is probably not reasonable to ask of all of us. And it's partly why um, the structures matter here and not asking sort of the token person to do it all is an unreasonable expectation. And it's one way that institutions actually really end up back in this inclusion model, not the systemic transformation model. Because you ask one person to transform a, a very old system that's not based in wanting to do right by us. Um, and so I just wanted, I, I think the other thing that happens, right, it, is that you can think about this as kind of a professional split. Um, but part of what I'd like people to know is the way that I do research means that if the university actually positions me to do harm to communities, it's not just me that takes that reputational and relational hit to my relationship to communities. It's my partner, it's my nieces and nephews, it's my children that also end up in funky places. Um, and I, and I, what I think that piece is something that most academics don't understand. Indian country is very small. Right, we know each other very quickly. And so a project that goes bad because of university constraints, most university folks can move on from them. But it's the kind of thing that people can hold on to. And many of us know stories about bad projects from two decades ago, that kind of thing. Um, communities don't have the same kind of churn that I think mainstream communities or non-indigenous communities have. So the model of understanding impact is usually very short timeframes, not longer term intergenerational timeframes. Um, I think the other thing that I wanted to make clear, so that, that relational piece means that in order to do good research, 
Indigenous scholars are maintaining their familial responsibilities and their community responsibilities um, at the same time, because you can't give those up and, and remain a good, a good academic. <laughs> That's, that's a, it's, it's a really hard place to be. And what I hear from a lot of junior scholars is they're always feeling like they have to sacrifice or cut off part of what they feel like is responsible. And it's the fast track to feeling like, I don't know if I can do this thing called being a professor. The last thing that I just wanted to make visible before I stop talking is, um, I also think this piece around colleague mentorship um, and student mentorship is um, deep invisibilized labor that I do think universities need to do a much better job of. And here's where I'll say this. It's both with junior faculty and students, but um, the scale of requests by colleagues, well-meaning requests for me to mentor them, it's not how they say it, but help them be wiser, help them read their grant proposals so that to see if, it'll, if it's, they've gotten it right, to suggest reading so that they can learn more. Um, to help them know we want to do this work. Do you know anyone in this community? The scale of kind of relational requests and labor extraction from colleagues is overwhelming to me, to be honest, um, um, particularly as I sit in this role. And I don't, I think it's really important for people and particularly institutions to think about, and we're trying to work on it, like What's a structure that makes that manageable? Because on the one hand, I'm actually really glad colleagues are asking because you could just not ask and that would be worse. But the ask is again, having a, it pulls, right? And it asks for kind of an unrecognized labor that is a problem. And I think the reason that I name that is because oftentimes um, that also happens to tribal nations, like universities want to partner, schools want to partner and they want to partner towards their own interests. They don't necessarily do the work to see how are the partnerships actually aligned with tribal initiatives and needs so that our partnerships are solving community or they're contributing to community ends, not just representational kind of ends driven by universities. That dynamic is one of those kind of reckoning with core dynamics that I think we all have a lot um, to learn from and to keep thinking about. So I think I'll end. Um, hopefully, Jesse, that's the kind of thing you wanted. Like I said, this is a different sort of talk. Um, wasn't my like, here's my scholarship, but um, I'm hoping it's useful to you all. Yes. Yes, Dr. Bing. Jimmy Glitch, uh, so good to hear from you this morning. What an honor and, and an inspiration too. Good, good to hear you, good to see you. Uh, my power cut out, so sorry I was unavailable there. I missed a little bit in the middle, but I'd like to, uh, Dr. Megan Bang, if you if you have a minute, uh, I'd like to invite some questions for you. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, participants, um, colleagues, friends, and colleagues, uh, bring it in. Let's. Um, in, uh, I'd like to give you an opportunity to engage with our speaker. Um, so feel free to uh, turn on your video and unmute your mic and um, and ask a question of Dr. Megan Bang of Northwestern University Center for Native American and Indigenous Research, working with our former colleague. Well, she's now your former colleague too. <laughs> she's a former, former <laughs> Dr. Lowe. Uh, um, this is good. Je Hi, Jesse, Gavin. hey. It's Gavin. I have a question, but I will say Claudia had a question in the chat that I wanted to maybe honor first before mine because she had a great one over there. I didn't know if Claudia <laughs> wanted to ask that or if that could just be read. Yeah, I see. Uh, you mean about the about indigenous peoples outside the United States? Is that the question yes. you're probably yes. to? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the one that I was calling your attention to. So that's what we call global indigeneities, and absolutely. Um, Here's what I'll tell you the way that we've approached that is that as a university recognizing with its history, we privilege starting um, building partnerships with Cheyenne and Arapaho and the peoples whose territories that we're inhabiting. Um, and so we have this um, Cheyenne and Arapaho, the Chicago urban Indian community, um, and then the Great Lakes tribal communities were kind of, we were gonna make sure we were doing work there first. We have since expanded. And what you didn't see is we actually have fellows doing work with indigenous communities all over the world. Um, and while I don't know that I think that they're all similar oppressive or racist systems, I, well, I think they're, I think 
Indigenous peoples are dealing with oppressive systems and there are similarities across. I do also think there are particularities that are really important to recognize. So we do a lot of work globally um, and are really working on what it looks like. Um, and here's what I'll say about that. I actually think it's quite important um, in opening up the possible for US-based indigenous communities too. Right, when we learn about what indigenous, how indigenous communities elsewhere have pushed in particular ways, it's why I was doing all that work to say the US has a particularly investment in indigenous absence that shapes us differently. Um, and it's not that other communities don't like, right, we're, I, I'm very happy about Brazil elections. Thankfully, indigenous peoples in Brazil will probably not be totally annihilated, which is where we were headed under the last leadership. But uh, um, there are some particularities that we think are important, but absolutely, and we are really working on, we, we, we partner with the Buffett Institute at Northwestern, which is really focused on global um, issues and global partnerships. So for sure we do all of it. I just want everyone to hear, we were principally and ethically committed to the places in our, our particular histories as the beginning of partnerships, and then how it is that we might expand um, and continue to build outside of those localities. Thank you. That's great. Great to know. Yeah, I have a, I have a question I want to follow up on. Thank you so much, Dr. Bang, for your presentation. Um, it's nice to hear the pracademics uh, talking. Uh, <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, one thing that I've noticed that we did a partnership between the Ho-Chunk Nation and uh, a particular village in around the area. The village wanted to build better relationships with the tribal land on which they sit. Um, yada, yada, yada. It worked out pretty well, I would say. And, you know, now the, you know, they, there have been like a flag raising ceremony in that village. You know, they've installed a crest. They're installing cultural markers. I think they have a pretty good relationship. The thing that we're experiencing is that other people now, other other people, other villages, cities, towns, counties, kind of want to do the same thing, um, and they're like, "Oh, you know, can can we work with the Ho Chi Nation, or can we do that kind of thing?" So I feel like sometimes, um, like, how do you deal? Thank you, President White Eagle, for giving me the thumbs up on that. You can actually confirm that it was a decent partnership, and Jesse was a big part of that. But I feel like in in some ways we're kind of a victim of our own success. And then it like creates more demand on some of these um, native populations that it's like, oh, okay, well, we don't have the staff to do that for everyone. So I'm just kind of wondering how to like, do you have any recommendations for how to deal with that tension? Yeah, infrastructure and make them pay for it so that it's not free labor that it pulls the nation away from doing the work they need for their, you know what I mean? Like what you're asking is what does it mean to build capacity for tribal nations to be able to be in partner partnership, right? I think. I mean, I would ask Navajo, I mean, I would ask uh, Ho Chunk Nation about that, not not me really, but it's the same issue that I'm talking about. That what happens is when someone, if if the request comes from outside of community, from outside of already in relation with community, its impact can to be disfigure community initiatives. But in my experience, lots of communities want partnerships like that because they see it as a longer term kind of thing. But you you have the president of the Ho Nation here. What do you think um, about how to do this? Well, yeah, I think it's a, a great, great thing. You know, it's kind of taking the next step. You know, one, you know, we have the, the land acknowledgements going on and um, then the flag raisings, you know, that, that provides that, um, I guess the environment where, you know, that we're represented and, you know, this is just taking the next step. So, you know, these are, um, you know, you get pulled in a little bit different directions every day, but, you know, one one step at a time, that's all we can do. And that's that's probably the way we'll, we'll go through with it. Yeah, that's great. And, but Dr. Bang, I love the idea of saying, make them pay for it. Um, if you want to do this work, uh, help add financial capacity so that the nation can actually do this work in, in earnest. I mean, I think the cities and villages, like Middleton came up to me. I think, Jesse, I don't know if you remember, we did that Badger Talks Live, and Middleton came up to us afterwards. We're like, oh, we want to do the same thing that Wanaki did and, and everything. And it's like, well, you, 
you know, it took a lot of work and it took a lot of time and it took their mayor and it took their, you know, all this stuff to get involved and their council president and all this stuff. So um, I don't know if they're ready for that, but I guess I just, I can imagine other people might want to do it, but I love the idea of the capacity building. So thank you um, for that. And thanks for your presentation. Can I add one thing to this that I've seen and, you know, I spent time in, in the Pacific Northwest and have really learned a lot from the communities there. There's also this funny meme around going around that it's like, oh, wait, I did your land acknowledgement. Like, you seriously want your land back? Uh, right? <laughs> like that kind of thing. Um, and I guess there is really interesting, serious questions about like, what's a new governance potential structure here that is um, that and, and Washington state is a really, um, and I know a little bit about Wisconsin sort of natural resource management. I, I don't believe it's quite where Washington state is, but all of Washington state is co-managed with tribes. And in fact, actually Washington state has come to recognize without tribes, those ecosystems would collapse because it's the tribes that have actually sustained the salmon. Um, and they have done those modelings. And so I would also say that like you have towns and that is a really interesting kind of movement building to think about um, what does it look like to infrastructure so it's sustainable. For me, this problem happens with schools. So I train a bunch of teachers, we develop models that are really ethically sound, and then 15 other schools are like, oh, we wanna do that. And then they wanna go ask things of the local tribal community to now do things. And so you've created the same problem. Um, and the trouble is our tribal departments of ed, are they responsible for their own kids and everybody else's kids? Is that a department of ed for the state responsibility to build out? Like all of those questions, I think become about policy infrastructure. And right now, Indian ed in most states, right? This is a, five, uh, this is a federal structure, was designed to serve Indian kids. It didn't imagine that Indian education would actually lead the transformation of better education for all kids. So, so it's really underfunded, at least from a federal and state level kind of um, formula grants. So it's a, do you see what I'm saying? There's a structural problem that's actually similarly replicated that has to do with my very first point about whether or not we think native peoples and communities are actually leading social transformation for everybody. Thank you, Dr. Bang. Thanks, Gavin, for weighing in. Yeah, good to see you, good to hear you. Uh, participants, colleagues, uh, please join in if you, uh, if folks have questions, comments for uh, Dr. Bang of Northwestern, um, opening up the floor to uh, invite those questions in. I have a question for you, uh, Dr. Bang. Um, we, I'm interested to hear it at Northwestern in terms of place-based education on campus. Are you all doing, um, are you all developing uh, land stewardship curriculum or is that part of, um, this came up yesterday um, multiple times during um, day one of this training for, uh, for the Nelson Institute staff and affiliates. Um, talking about a need to do more um, outdoor education on campuses um, and also to bring, to uh, leverage land stewardship, um, you know, in the now as a way to teach um, historical and ongoing indigenous land stewardship. So thinking about partnering with tribes on curriculum development for land stewardship, but actually on campus. Um, so wondering if you all are seeing that or doing that at Northwestern. Yeah, I think um, we have a couple of ways to do it. It's actually a great question that I have started to say, like we should probably have a better, an overarching framework. What has happened, I think, is that we've done a number of things towards this. So the Indigenous Tour of Northwestern is a really beautiful one that kind of layers both history and stewardship. And it's literally a walking tour, but it's also a digital tour of Northwestern. Um, and I know you all are working on one. I've been on yours, it's lovely. 
Um, but that one exists. The other one is I mentioned that we have we have sort of Northwestern sugar bush that is coupled with a course um, taught by a professor that does that is in um, uh, he teaches environmental decision making and really uses sugar bush as and actually doing it like our student people register for the class and they actually make maple syrup here. Um, so we have a number of those practice those kinds of courses. What um, the other one that we have is um, CNAIR has developed some outdoor space and we have a teaching lodge there that we um, are engaged in a series of kinds of things that way too. Um, we do a bunch of kind of um, seasonal migrational um, kind of outdoor ed things that are connected to a couple classes. There's really interesting bird migrations that happen at Northwestern. There's also fish migrations and returns that happen at the lake. And so we've done a, we've set up a bunch of academic programming that is aligned with kind of the, the land patterns that are here. Um, I can tell you that I feel like what happened is a bunch of people got excited about doing things and did them, right? So we've had a lot of building. What we didn't do and where we're sort of getting to is we didn't say, what's the grand plan about this? Um, it was lots of people wanting to get excited about this. And so we're sort of figuring out what the other ones, I can tell you another one. I came to Northwestern because they told me they were gonna give me an acre of land so I could have, I could set up a, an outdoor learning environment. They have yet to give me my acre of land, but we'll see about that. But that was why I chose Northwestern over Stanford is because they promised me land. Um, and part of what I'm, I'm getting at is that we have a number of initiatives in motion. Um, and what I've been really pitching part of, in all seriousness, um, my deep critique of, of cognitive science and education is if you want me to be able to actually make progress in understanding human cognition, you can't only provide lab space that's inside buildings. You actually have to help me create land spaces to do the work that I wanted to do. Uh -huh. um, and that's real. <laughs> yeah, that's real. That's good to hear. Yeah. So yeah. we don't have a grand plan, but we should. <laughs> yeah. 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 I I uh thank you. Thank you for your response. Uh, it's good to be together this morning, folks. Um welcome in. Uh hi Alberto. I see you have your hand raised. I'll turn the mic over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jesse, and uh, thank you, Dr. Bank, for the for the presentation. That that was really great. Um, um, I think there's some basic concepts that uh, it could be considered like academic, but but they have very deep implications, practical implications, like the concept of sovereignty, autonomy, self determination, uh, and that how how those concepts relate to indigeneity. Um, and I, I wonder if you can say a little more. I know there was a slide with, with, with some quotes there. I'm, a, I'm also asking because yesterday we had a, like an hour conversation with a graduate student here in, at UW-Madison who was raising these questions in, in relation to the Zapatista communities in, in Chiapas in, in Mexico. And there was like, is, there seems to be like a limbo and, and, and a lot of confusion on these. So I, I think this, the, um, uh, this type of education and clarification, I think it would be really, really useful. Uh, of course, different context, but it's always the question, oh, how, how is it done in the US? How, how is the relation with, with, the, with the native nations there? So I, I just wanted to, to hear um, your take on that and, and thank you. Yeah, if I'm understanding you and you might bump me. So I don't think that Native people think, so, at least in the United States, sovereignty and self-determination are actually policy. They're not academic. They're actually what tribes, they're our governance structures. And so we have unique political status. And I think that that's one of the things that most people don't understand that there's actually like tribes have nation status. They're not communities that we have treaties and legal infrastructures. And, and so I think one of the major really consequential um, and interesting differences in lots of places is that not all indigenous communities have treaties in the same way that, that nations do in the United States. Um, so, so, and I, and I wanna be careful here because um, sovereignty and self-determination have legal code connect to them, but they also have lived kinds of things. And part of what, um, I mean by pedagogical sovereignty 
is not so much that I'm after some federal law that recognizes, although that would be good too, just to be clear, I'm, I'm good with that. But, but after really being able to say like, are we deciding what um, our teaching and learning practices should be? So, um, and I think that, uh, I think it depends on your kind of, you know, I, I'm not a legal scholar. I'm also not a policy scholar in the same kind of way that, that gives me good view of other, of kind of indigenous communities globally. But for example, Zapatistas have been a long-term standing community that have been asking and fighting for different kinds of legal recognitions forever, right? Like that's not a new thing. And I think that um, what I often mean is, yes, I mean treaties. Yes, I mean law and governance. And I mean it in lived ways. Right, um, and and there may be laws and governance and policies that emerge from that. But um, I'm also an urban Indian in a state where there's no federally recognized tribes. So we all should also recognize that I I think our communities live a commitment to sovereignty and self determination. That yes, is of course around like membership and tribes and things like that. But but we didn't stop wanting to be sovereign, self determining people because there's no federally recognized tribes in our state. Right, and that's partly what I, at least for me, that's partly what I'm always getting at is what's, what does it look like to live as sovereign self-determining people with our governments and our, and our social institutions intact, of course. But, you know, I don't, right now, the structure of work life doesn't make me feel so self-determining. Like we live in an economic structure that structures our everyday lives that, that isn't one that I would choose if I felt like I could. Right. Um, so that's, I don't know if that's a helpful way to understand what I was getting at. So yes, there's the kind of, there's different meanings. And I guess I would say different takes on what sovereignty and self-determination can mean. Um, I also want to recognize, right, like I'm First Nations and uh, until just a couple of years ago, the Indian, I, I, the Indian Act in Canada is just very complicated mess, mm -hmm. right? And there's been all kinds of deep sexism embedded in the Indian Act, right? Like in, in, in Canada, you were enfranchised if you gave up your status so you could vote, mm -hmm. right? So, so there's all kinds of um, dynamics to this that I think play out in particular ways. But I guess what I might argue is the core is that I do not know of any indigenous community that hasn't wanted to continue to exist uh -huh. on its own terms. Right. And that might be a base way to understand what it means to assert sovereignty. Uh -huh. or right. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much. This is very useful. And, and as, as we try to develop like study abroad opportunities for native nation students to other countries, I mean, this could be like a rich um, uh, feedback and a really rich uh, place for reflection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. Good to hear from you. Uh, Gavin, I see your hand up. I'll go back to you, Gavin. Hi, Gavin. I, I do want to cede my time to others if they have questions, but I do have another question for you, Dr. Bang. But others? Oh, OK. All right, you're, you're on standby then. <laughs> OK, Gavin doesn't want to hog the airtime. Are there others? Are there others you want to uh, join in to? Uh, rip to Rebecca has one in the chat. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I really appreciate this question, Rebecca. Um, so um, maybe it's actually on my my bucket list to get to Bolivia in particular. Um, so so here's what I would say about that. The answer is probably yes and no. Um, I, I think education as a tool of colonialism in its particularities has existed everywhere. Um, so I, I think Bolivia has made, Bolivia in particular is also the one that introduced all the new referendums two weeks ago at the United Nations. Bolivia and the Global South are doing really interesting things. Also, um, the forms of colonial education that are also existing in some places are astounding and really awful. So I think there's a question here about whether or not 
lots of places are still in um, implicit or explicit assumptions about nation state development and education's role in becoming an economic power. So many, many communities, many, many nations tend to view education not as acts of kind of environmental stewardship or um, indigenous survivance and resurgence, they're often positioned in a global market and that education is towards labor production, right? That is one of the base things is the problem is that education is often towards labor production. Um, it's kind of the wave that has impacted the world. We raise, people call it economist man. We're in the times of economist man. Um, so I, I think um, there are lots of things to be learned. I, I, I don't know that I've heard, I think Bolivia is probably getting there. Um, but I also know there's some complications for even kind of understanding Bolivia's structure in relationship to indigenous sovereignty, which is why you've had the election cycles you've had there. So it's not a simple, we're, we're, you, you know what I mean? Like it's complicated there too. So I think there are good things there. What I would argue though, is one thing as an as a education scholar and why pedagogical sovereignty um, I have watched beautiful curriculum and intentions be implemented in violent ways. So oftentimes what I think happens is that you have great abstract models, but what actually happens in interaction with learners in classrooms is not aligned with content intention. Um, and part of what I did at uh, the University of Washington was to say, great, we have beautiful standards and curriculum that are now legally required to be taught. And then if you go see how educators are implementing tribally designed, communally created curriculum, it's really bad, right? It's really bad. And the reason is, is because educators haven't had the opportunity to change their paradigms. So they still do crazy things with even tribally designed curriculum. So for me, that's a really important level of detail to kind of understand is important to attend to. And it's, partly because people think education is easy, which is why we create early childhood education in the United States that requires poverty in order to be in it, right? Because taking care of little kids is not really valued. Lisa, I see your hand up. Yes, hi, Dr. Bang. Thank you for the presentation. There's a lot to think about there and I really appreciate your time. Um, I actually am with the Dane County in Madison, Dane County, uh, County government. And there are a number of my colleagues on here as well. Um, and I'm curious about how or whether you have integrated your work on campus at Northwestern with Evanston, with Chicago, um, or if you have any re recommendations, you know, we do a lot of collaboration with the university as well. We have student interns, we have um, programs and, and, and work that we do with the university, but of course also we have, we are on indigenous land uh, mm -hmm. and um, we have a lot of different departments that have daily connections with these issues. And so I'm curious about your thoughts on on that for, for government? Um, I love that. Thank you for asking. And I hope you keep working towards that. Um, uh, we are, um, I am particularly in partnership with Evanston um, school districts in a number of ways. In fact, my son, the superintendent and I are going to introduce new legislation to the Illinois legislature on Wednesday of next week. So what we have, and it's partly because there were a number of really horrific follies, and I'm very proud of Marcus Wright, who's the superintendent, who was like, yeah, that was not, my son wasn't allowed to walk in graduation in June, first male in our family to graduate from high school because he had an eagle feather on his cap. Um, and um, his, his grandpa, who is a boarding school survivor, was there to watch his first grandson, first male in our family to graduate from high school, and they kicked him out of line. Um, so we've had lots that have um, that has have co has come to pass because of that. So we've done that kind of work. Um, unfortunately, that kind of work is motivated by deep error. So I would also encourage you not to do that. <laughs> um, um, and um, I, the Northwestern is not, but I will say that um, most of us who are kind of have family in Chicago are involved with the Chicago um, American Indian Community Collaborative, who is working very closely with the city and the state. We've done really the work of organizing and the university being in appropriate relationships with 
what I would call community-led efforts for policy change. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's really important is that university kind of forgets that it has big power sometimes and it can overstep its place. So we've really tried to partner with um, community efforts and lend our expertise to them. Um, so I've been on this committee with a bunch of community members to draft this new legislation for indigenous history and sovereignty curriculum. I've also been, right, so we've done that, but it hasn't been our lead and that's by design. Um, I will tell you that I've also done this in lots of other places um, that might be, um, might have been more eager and less error prone than local community about these things. I think Illinois' general literacy about Indian people is terrible because we don't have tribes. So like there is a, a real lack of understanding at all levels about native peoples in Illinois. So there's been a lot. Um, here's what I would say. Um, I think this is back to the infrastructure. Um, I think that developing infrastructure within local governments that is deliberatively focused on indigenous peoples across how local government works is probably a really important step. Um, one thing that Evanston has done that I would tell everyone we should figure out how to do is Evanston has the first reparations law for black folks in the United States that is actually material. And so this is like Gavin's question about how to do this. I think there's really interesting ways that local governments could could do things like be in co-management with tribes that could think about like, what's a tax structure that recognizes whose land we're on? What is a series of policy initiatives that would really be um, deeply productive and long-term looking? So the one thing that I would say about the reparations law in, in Evanston, um, it's backwards leaning in many ways, right? And it got structured to produce wealth, to recognize wealth inequalities. It, it didn't structure what it's gonna mean to have deep adaptation because our lands and waters are changing and we're gonna have to figure out how to live together differently. So there could be really beautiful ways to, I think, lean in, but I do think it's a question of whether or not local governments are gonna infrastructure recognition of sovereignty, um, and continual relations, not just project by project with tribes. Thank you very much. And thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Bang. Um, any other questions for Dr. Bang? We've got, um, we have time for more. Gavin, do you wanna ask yours, sir? Yeah, if you don't mind, um, Dr. Bang, this is more of kind of a movement building question. Um, <clears throat> I'm really active in the community engagement scholarship space. Um, you know, the people who are trying to like change tenure and promotion reform to acknowledge that doing work with communities counts or should count toward tenure and promotion. Um, and so kind of welcoming in, um, as you call it, kind of indigenous ways of knowing um, welcoming that into like our formal way that we kind of deem knowledge as like acceptable or not acceptable. And so I'm just kind of wondering, like, do, do you ever think of your work as that kind of civically engaged campus, community engaged scholarship transformation, you know, how, the civic role of, of universities? Because there, there's an entire network of people out there that are like talking very much about what you're talking about, but also talking about it in terms of black communities or Latinx communities and making sure that community partners, when they're asked to do things, they are paid appropriately. Like, you know, in, in our case at UW Madison, like our mortgage center for public service and, you know, all different kinds of people have civic action plan and they're trying to implement it across campus. So I'm just wondering like, does your work intersect with that network? Um, yeah, and also I'll just say, so so absolutely, um, right, and I'm an education scholar, so I approach it in particular kinds of ways. Um, you know, I, um, I, I think, so I, I put this um, link to National Academies of Education wrote this report around civic reasoning and discourse and where the edges of the field were about this. Um, and um, I do think about intersecting in all those kinds of ways. And I think um, 
part of why I think my beginning points about understanding native peoples and communities as not another racialized community is because my experience is that there's real work between sort of community engaged social justice movements that are often from a race-based lens, right? And understanding what a civics is that actually upholds tribal sovereignty. Um, and that is a really, we've just, that is a complicated space. And I think, um, and I, but it, here's what I think is, um, is, is super important about doing that is most universities continue to perpetuate a kind of view of indigenous absence, right? In all kinds of ways, whether it's through indigenous ways of knowing, indigenous sovereignty, understanding political responsibilities that as a citizen of a settler colonial nation, right? All of those things I think are actually what it should look like for all people to understand. But we often set those things up as kind of outliers. And so one, one thing that Northwestern has been pushing for, and I don't know if we'll get there, we're getting to a couple is, what would it mean for all freshmen at Northwestern to have to take the class about it? Like you could as a university set that as a standard, right? To do all of those things. And it would be, in Canada, it's actually happening. There are a bunch of universities that have said it's a freshman require, it's a graduation requirement to take a class <laughs> focused on indigenous peoples as a way of demonstrating um, some of their commitments. And I think that's a really, why, why that's a radical proposal is kind of stunning, right? Um, yes. <laughs> right, you thought as well. Yeah. Um, why is that so radical? Exactly. Um, yes. And right, students have to pass a U.S. Constitution test in order to graduate from high school. Right. Right. And that U.S. Constitution test uh, almost says nothing, if nothing, depending upon state about tribes. Yeah. So um, I, yeah, absolutely, Gavin. I think it intersects in all kinds of ways. Um, but um, yeah, I put that link in because I've been thinking a lot about civics education recently and how I think about that specifically in science ed is I've been saying, so how about if we had a science education driven by should we questions, which right. most yeah. educators would say that um, should we questions are at the core of civic reasoning. Yeah, and Dr. Bang, I guess the really targeted question for you is, do you feel like <clears throat> the tenure and promotion reform, like, process supports your work or do you feel like it is out of step with that work and if it is out of step then are you trying to change that are you allying with other people on campus to change that i'm very particularly interested in tmp yeah that. yeah um sorry um uh well i got tenure and promoted a long time ago and and it was rough right um i can just tell you i was told that i was an activist not a scholar and wasn't smart enough to get a phd in graduate school because i was after this and and then there were a few people who had to intervene so i didn't get kicked out um so so that was a couple decades ago um so yes it was rough and what it meant is is that i had to do a bunch of scholarship that was translational scholarship right and i i still end up functioning like that i've just found ways for that to be productive um, are we working on shifting that? For sure. One way that we've done that is to say that a tenure um, and promotion committee can have community members on it, that it's not only academics, that we might request letters um, of review from community leaders as part of a package of people who are doing scholarship in and with Indigenous communities. Because partly, and this is partly my point, is lots of people are starting to do work, whether they're doing it well is an entirely different question. And most academics have, would have no way of knowing that. So um, I don't think Northwestern is nearly far enough about this. I'll just tell you that. Like we have a long ways to go and it's not just for indigenous people because Northwestern is locked into. There's, there's a kind of, <laughs> there's kind of pure research and then there's applied research and there's translational research um, and people's perceptions of what like fundamental research looks like, what's applied research and what's translational research is a really hegemonic recreation of Western epistemologies being the real thing. Um, Cause I just don't, indigenous communities, our knowledge systems just don't work like that at all. Like it's not how we would do it. So uh, Northwestern is far. Here's what I will tell you that is really beautiful that I've seen in the last 15 years is that there's enough scholars indigenous and not 
who I think understand what you're getting at, that it means that it's, um, I feel like the list of people to ask for letters has exponentially grown, which is one way to think about it. The other thing that we really worked hard to do is to say, we're trying to recognize service as not being nice, but not really necessary, right? Um, well, and and service building. usually means service to the department, yeah. not service to any external partners. Yeah. So those kinds of shifts and norms we've done, um, I can tell you at the University of Washington, the recreation of tenure standards was beautiful. Northwestern's not quite there. But the idea of indigenous knowledge systems, of service, of partnership, of recognizing like the creation of policy briefs for tribes, writing legislation, those became high impact publications because they were work that actually mattered to communities. And we had a whole, we created a context of high impact publications as determined by community as an example of some, some shifts so that it wasn't- Wow, all can you like send us a link or something? Yeah, so I actually can I can put you in touch with, with faculty at UW that are still there, but I was part of that revision of tenure and promotion standards. You know who else is doing beautiful work? So the William T. Grant Foundation, which if you all, I know you all are up to efforts, they have um, something called an institutional challenge grant that is after doing just this and will fund it actually um, to say, what does it look like to transform the institution in order to get to a kind of research that actually does stuff in the world and doesn't live only in the ivory tower and asking for institutional change specifically. Um, so you might look there, but um, the University of um, Colorado Boulder has really done remarkable work about this too. It's really shifted um, all of these standards. And it started in the School of Ed, because that's what I know about, but it's actually become university-wide. That is fantastic. I would love yes. to learn more about the CU Boulder and the UW stuff. So I don't know if you have a, like, a link to the people who- I, I'll send I Jesse something with. if that's all right. And then okay, and we'll, sure. and make some introductions to a couple people there you might want to talk to. That sounds right. good. Yeah, I mean, we we had a really, there, there has been TMP reform stuff at UW-Madison that is in this direction, but it's in a very specific niche. It's not in all colleges. It's not in all pathways to TMP. So I think um, the civic action planning team on this campus has a specific action group who's working on TMP reform and Eric Sangren, who used to be on faculty, whatever. I think some people on here know Eric. I think he's been a big champion of TMP reform. And I feel like if we were to take some of this to him, it could be really impactful. So I'd really appreciate any connections or names. Yeah. And I can tell you one thing as a halfway step. So I write or whoever the director of senior is can be requested to write a letter for any of our affiliated faculty as part of their tenure and review process. And we are often the ones that actually ask for external letters that are community letters and it's become a kind of part of the package. It's not sufficient at all, like it's not, but it is one way that we've created actually a, a kind of wedge in faculty's review packages really directly at CNAIR. Um, and they're held with a particular kind of weight um, in tenure and review right now. So it's not the same magic transformation that I feel like UW and Boulder have done, but we have figured out a few steps that way. Good to hear. Thank you, Gavin. Thank, Thank you, you, Megan Bang. Uh, and it's good to hear about these other universities uh, putting some peer pressure on us <laughs> to do better, do better. And, uh, so folks, um, we're going to uh, Megan Bang. If it's okay with you, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, feel free to stay on. Uh, colleagues and compatriots, uh, please uh, join me in expressing our gratitude to Dr. Megan Bang uh, for her scholarship and leadership <clears throat> and, uh, and your personhood. Thank you for your personhood as well. Uh, so good to hear from you. So good to be together this morning, folks. Uh, what a great start to our morning. Uh, I'd like to um, take a moment to welcome in um, President White Eagle of the Ho-Chunk Nation, uh, Heine P, President White Eagle, um, and Pina Gigi for joining in. I'd like to uh, turn the mic over to you, sir, for um, any words you wanna offer up this morning.
if now is a good time. <clears throat> sure. Good morning, everyone. Say, Heine P. Heine Kadigi. That means uh, good morning. And Honey uh, Chow Wida Hi P. It's good to see you all. Those of you that have your camera on, uh, not saying you don't have to turn your camera on, but uh, that uh, it's good good to see you. It's what we say. And, um, you know, it's uh, always a pleasure to be a part of the, uh, and be uh, invited to attend the uh, the program here. You know, I've been in uh, uh, participation probably the last maybe three, three years, potentially four, but I remember three. And uh, it's um, uh, definitely a, a, a great time, great time to know that you guys are, you have that focus, you have that mind to, uh, to help the Native nations here in Wisconsin. And, um, you know, obviously I'm the president of the Ho-Chunk Nation. It's a elected position. I'm in uh, the, my final year here. And you know, making determinations on do I run again? You know, there was one recently. We had a, a meeting with Governor Evers up in uh, the Menominee Nation area, and I was uh, telling him, reminding him, like, "Hey, remember we sat at a Brewer game, and uh, he had just been elected, and I had just been elected." And I said, "And if you run again, you know, I'll I, I'll run again, and then we'll kind of we'll be." Uh, serving at the same time and uh so that was our pact at that time and uh so i'm i'm i still haven't decided yet if i'm gonna run again that's really really a, a tough job it's a fun job but it's a tough job in terms of uh uh kind of uh the political nature how that that beast itself is uh you know we just got done seeing all these different ads on tv but you know, tribal politics is no different, but uh, it's a, a great um, to uh, have these, uh, you know, we're hearing about uh, flag raising ceremonies and how that how that affects uh, uh, tribal tribal members in on the uh, in the learning environment on the UW campus. And, you know, we have a lot of uh, history. We have the shared history and our, our, our shared future initiative. And, you know, in a recent lunch with the uh, chancellor uh, up here in the Black River area, you know, I was talking with her and saying, you know, you know, this, our, our shared future, you know, the initiative is very similar to, to what a treaty is. And, you know, so there's, there's a little bit of obligation by us, you know, to, uh, to make time and take time to, uh, to engage uh, one another, and then the the work that we focus on, it's uh, it's to uh, promote that and kind of uh, to grow it. So, you know, I always let people know about Ho Chunk and what what that means uh, in the translation of the the language to English, and it's uh, it's about a sacred voice. So Ho is. Uh, means uh, voice also means fish but here it means voice and then we use the word uh, wakan chunk and we kind of do what the linguists call eliding and you know that wakan part is and then we stick with that chunk chunk so it's not really chunk like like it's spelled but we try to uh, make it easy for you to get close to to speaking the language so Wakan Chunk, and uh, those, uh, it, it, it kind of matters, it matters, and, you know, and I know you're all aware, aware of that, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, a good, good relationship, and it's a good, uh, good practice, and it's good to know that, you know, that the work that you're doing every day is, you uh, uh, directed towards making the the relationship better you know there's a there's a, a societal consciousness that that exists and that's what that's kind of what this um, this environment is right now so it's really um uh, i guess worthwhile to be uh you know 
uh, spending the time to do this, and it's really, uh, really, really, uh, um, really. I guess it's really enjoyable, you know, to to see you all and uh, say a few words to you. So I'm really uh, glad that uh, all the work that you're doing, you know. Uh, there were, there were years where uh, with the Ho-Chunk people that we had, uh, you know, like a, I guess a protective nature on our, on our cultural knowledge, our cultural history. And, um, you know, this is kind of uh, points, points to us that, you know, it's time to, uh, to share a little bit more. And then, you know, we're, and then we're going to do it on, on our terms. We're going to tell our story and then we're going to, share what what we feel is appropriate so you know we we have a, a a lot of history you know some of the history we're seeing you know that physical evidence with the the work that uh, i see bill down here on the on the uh, uh video that uh his, his work with the the uh, wisconsin state historical society and you know the uh, recovery of these uh dugout canoes one was uh, uh i believe 18 or yeah 1800 years old and then recently the uh 3000 year old and there's probably some older ones down there too that um that are that you know they're there and you know they recovered them and it's the physical proof that you know that we weren't um you know just sort of uh we weren't savages, I guess you could say. We had a, a system of uh, transportation. We had a system of uh, governance. We had a system of justice that that we had prior to uh, European contact, and you know that that kind of gives uh, you know that proof that that may be needed for some to uh, accept that or um, understand that, and you know that's the work that that the tribal nations here are doing, you know, the Ho-Chunk Nation and the other nations here in Wisconsin. And, um, you know, some of the things I heard through uh, Dr. Bing, uh, her presentation that, uh, you know, we're working with uh, to uh, um, set up time with uh, the Illinois governor to, uh, to discuss uh, Indian child welfare, as well as, uh, you know the tribal sovereignty and recognizing that and you know that's really what what the work that that um you know the way i feel about the work that I, the office that i hold it's all about you know protecting our our sovereignty it's you know it's political in nature but it's it's always protecting and defending our sovereignty and that's uh kind of an everyday thing and the work that you guys are doing you know the the time time you're taking to uh to think about that is uh refreshing and then also i heard you know the initiative up in canada regarding uh graduation requirement you know i have talked with uh uh that uh, i forget his first name he's a, he's a president of the uw regents rothman and uh you know we had that discussion and i also brought that up with uh, uh chancellor and you know so it's on the table now and you know it's something that it's not an easy easy step and you know i don't fully understand the uh uh the organization of the university and the academics but but it's a proposal to uh to uh to get us past uh it's kind of to evolve our our relationship that we um that you know, I'm president for four years. There'll be a new president coming in, and then when he comes in, he or she comes in, then they're going to have to build those same uh, under levels of understanding and a graduation requirement of you know tribal nations of Wisconsin. That you know that it would it's only going to uh, propel us forward into uh, uh, understanding of the. Uh, um, you know these uh, these uh, treaty uh, obligations, and um, and then that tribal history and that culture that that comes through the uh, initiatives like diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. That it it's it's falls right in that that area. So really glad to be a part. Uh, they give me the amount of time, so thanks for that, uh, 
Jesse. So, I, but I'll take this much time to to say welcome, you know, to the to the event here today. Then I really do appreciate all the work that you do. It uh, uh, shows your 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 heart and your focus, and it's uh, how it collides with the the Native nations. Really, um, really does help us. So I appreciate it. Uh, so I'll close with Hanai uh, Nagikui Wainigi Napui. Thank you for listening to me. <clears throat> uh, Pina Gigi, President White Eagle, it's so good to so good to be together this morning. Um, and uh, Pina Gigi for that support and encouragement. Um, yeah, I was remembering that too, sir. That you were uh, you were at our first training that we offered. I think that was in 2018 with Amanda White Eagle. Because she was she was speaking and. And that's when we met. And so, yeah, you've been uh, with us consistently uh, for these uh, for these uh, milestone uh, trainings that we're offering. And so, um, again, Pina Geeky for that support and encouragement. That's that's so good to hear. And um, I'd like to uh, transition now to our next session. Uh, we have uh, we've taken a little flex time in our agenda, but that's um, just fine. There's plenty of time this morning. So um, we with uh, such good discussion this morning, I wanted to um, give that time to uh, to um, continue. So um, thanks to the participants and to speakers for your patience um, as we uh, pull this all together. I'd like to transition now to our next uh, session. Um, please join me in welcoming in uh, Mr. Bill Quackenbush uh, of the Ho-Chunk Nation, who serves as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Uh, Bill and I have uh, worked together on um, several courses and projects, and um, we're welcoming you in, Bill Heine uh, P, and welcome yes. in, and uh, I'll turn the mic over to you, sir. All right. Good morning, everyone. I hopefully you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Thank you. Great. Sounds good. I found a, a quiet place in my home uh, this morning. I had some uh, running to do towards uh, the opposite way of my office. So um, I got back just in time. I logged in a little late. I apologize for coming in late. Uh, as uh, Dr. Conaway had mentioned, uh, I work for the Ho-Chunk Nation. I also am a tribal member uh, uh, of the Ho-Chunk people as well. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, President Marlon White Eagle for speaking so eloquently. And I am going to say Ma Ma Marlon is very modest in his speaking and that uh, he has so much more as far as representing our Ho-Chunk Nation than he alludes to. Uh, and I fully encourage him to run for a second term. I mean, he pulled us through a, a, a most treacherous time for our tribe during a, the mid of a pandemic and we're still here today and we're better and stronger than we will always be. Whoever is leading our nation, they take on a great responsibility and they gift everything they can to us and more. So I encourage that to Marlon and his staff. Um, um, it, it's great to have an administration that allows us to uh, work freely amongst uh, our, our areas of expertise out there. And um, our Heritage Preservation Department, for example, uh, we focus on a lot on our language, uh, a lot on our veterans affairs, the folks with our veterans, uh, as well as our enrollment, which is very important for our nation, right? Uh, but also another component of that is our cultural resources and that protection and preservation and that, and most of all, and why I sit here today, that perpetuation of our knowledge, uh, the ability to uh, pass on to not only our, our tribal constituents, right? Our youth and our uh, communities, uh, but also everybody who wants to uh, learn a little more about the whole chunk in an accurate manner. And that's why it becomes important for us to interact and, and involve ourselves in this very, you know, subject matter today. Um, when I was asked several weeks ago by the organizers of this gathering, for example, they mentioned, uh, oh, what would your title want, you know, be for this? And uh, that was hard to place a specific title on something that encompasses such a broad range of education, right? Uh, so I basically, you know, asked for it to be titled, you know, the Tribal Cultural Perspectives Towards e Educational Collaboration. Uh, it's a long sentence for me to state, but in short, I think what it means to me is that, and I want to go back some and and working with 
uh, Dr. Conaway, and, and I referred to her as Jesse and amongst ourselves there and Jess and or whatever she really wants to be called at that moment, right? And um, I hate to say how many years we've actually collaborated together with not only formally but informally because she's only 29 years old. Half her life she's been talking to me, right? So that said, um, um, some of the things I had jotted down on a, a sheet of paper <laughs> here uh, are some of the projects that we have formally worked on uh, through the uh, collaboration of Nelson Institute, uh, some of the University of Madison, and whatever project that Jesse is working on, I have a, a kindred interest of that because I know ultimately I get residual products out of that that I use that I bring back to our tribe, right? And uh, uh, one of the projects I had jotted down here this morning was uh, uh, the one that uh, involved the city of Monona, uh, the Woodland Park uh, um, and how that went is Jesse had got a hold of me and says, you know, I'm looking towards uh, an environmental uh, uh, workshop or course for the university there. And and uh, we were considering using these three parks in the city of Monona. And she left it the three and one of them was Woodland Park. And we took a real quick run about there and found that uh, for my purposes, you know, Woodland Park serves as a classic example of how a municipality or a city or um, uh, looks at you know their parks for example as green space first and foremost uh, how can we get more people across the gates of our our parks you know and uh, how can they all enjoy it you know the diversity of views and they focus some on <clears throat> management of course the knowledge of that but they also focus on trying to get people on these trails and out there and kick tires on that and serve you know, offer something for their local, you know, communities. But what happens oftentimes, you'll find a lot of these green spaces also including areas of cultural sensitivity that we have within tribes uh, or even in the communities there because they're green space for reasons and that uh, they weren't deemed usable for anything else uh, other than for maybe municipal use. <clears throat> so oftentimes what we find is that um, we have to come in there and try to add, you know, however we can to protect and preserve cultural resources that are within that green space. Woodland Park, for example, had a great example of that, is that in amongst the top of this bounce system, you had utilities up there, water tower, uh, uh, various trails up in there, signage up there that was a little dated, um, you know, and the, the local community used it you know, a lot for uh, getting away from the rigors of life. There are a lot of you know, environmental processes that they are attempting or taking place there. Uh, I think they were trying to attempt to do an you know, Oakland savanna type setting on top. Uh, but in short, there was a lot of adverse effects taking place towards that specific physical thing there, those effigy mounds that also sit up on top of that mound up there or on that knoll there. Uh, so it was a classic example that Jesse had brought to me as well as to her students that if you had, you know, the ability to create a management plan uh, for this park, for example, how would you entail not only the environmental, but also the cultural resources and, and incorporate that into, you know, some sort of a management plan? And not only did she work with the students and with the tribe, but she also worked with this local municipality, right, the city of Monona. And we got to know Jake Anderson and, and several folks. In fact, the students even presented to you know, the town board there about some of the processes that, that they were developing for this course. And long story short, out of that, a lot of good came from that. Um, I think I, if I can go to the chat over there and I'm going to include a link, there it is, to uh, City of Monona's um, uh, webpage uh, that talks about the park system. And they have now included uh, several components in there that they didn't necessarily have to do, uh, but they incorporated, you know, very mounds management programs. Um, uh, they they offset the, the the disturbance to the mounds, the the trails and such, and began managing those mounds uh, in a better way. And so that ultimately comes back to our tribe as a benefit. You know, it's it's unwritten for the most part, but there's a true benefit to our tribe and our culture and our heritage and our connection to the Madison area. Um, from that, I took away as a great learning tool of how I can and cannot, you know. Uh, in, you know, increase, you know, the awareness of students participating. These are our future, right? Uh, you educate them and to give them a more diverse way of looking at uh, perspectives and the students gain exponentially from that. I have students still contacting us 
the tribe there because they're moving on in their careers now and and they remember working collaboratively with tribes with municipalities and they they garner so much more from that uh, fast forward to the village of Wanakee. I was gave to mention that you know this this region's project and it's somewhat dated now but not really I mean you talk about the recent flag raising uh, the incorporation of a whole chunk nation seal uh, within their village signage over there. I mean, we had a dedication up there and an, and an availing of that process. You know, um, within the last year, Marlon alluded to, and as well as Jesse knows, uh, that, that awareness of the, the, the steep, the, you know, uh, heritage of the Ho-Chunk being integral to the Madison area and, and that dugout canoe factor there and that um, it's been six years I was working on a project there to incorporate a better awareness of Ho-Chunk in the Madison area. A real big concentration was that. Uh, well, this fit hand in hand with the village of Wanakee. You know, the, here they're in the watershed, you know, of the four lakes, Mendota, right? Uh, Monona, uh, Wabisa, and Kaganza. And not only that, the, the Yahara River, the Catfish River, um, there was such an awareness that needed to be said to the village of Wanakee. And they may or may not have known that, uh, but their focus, you know, at the time of this class introduction, this incorporation, you know, was that, you know, we have a lot of green space and parks and we got beautiful trails up here. You know, we're all about expansion of the communities, the housing and infrastructure, and this village is just really growing. But there was little awareness about the important role they played in the overall uh, Yahara River watershed area and a lot of retention ponds, a lot of, you know, spaces being incorporated into housing and so on and so forth. And their focus was driven uh, by today's societal ways. Uh, and when the university, you know, and the uh, uh, Nelson Institute, and we began to work with them, uh, there was like an enlightenment of sorts, if you want to use that term. They, they began to understand you know, that there was an important role that they played not only in their specific footprint, but also for everything that not only above in their watershed, but below them, and that there need to be a network and collaboration and some working together and fellowship and partnerships out there in your communities, or else you start satelliting yourself through time. And they began to reach out, and we had the other cities and, and villages around there seeing what was taking place up there and they became aware and even mentioned this, you know, how are we handling all of this, you know, residual, I want to call it that, um, people calling up and wondering, how can we get involved in this in our communities? I've been called numerous times, Green Lake and, you know, Milwaukee, all these different areas there because they want a piece of that pie. They don't know where to get started out there, but they see us now out there in uh, in the public, you know, making making, you know, uh, all this, so, you know, social media and all these, you know, news medias and such like there. And, and you're on the front page. You, you literally are on the front page of what's taking place. You're the heartbeat of Wisconsin, right? Uh, Wisconsin being an environmental, you know, technically state. You know, we went through several, you know, um, you know, administrations there. We wanted to become now open for business. But in reality, Wisconsin has uniqueness, you know, like none other. We need to protect that because we're part of that Great Lakes region over there and we we'll always will be. And we have to continue to protect that as such out there. And that's why it comes hand in hand, the environmental and the cultural and the spiritual integral, you know, societal processes over there. It's all integrated together. You can't just take one component and tear it apart and put it down over here. Everything mel melds well into each other. Uh, so in short, at Village Wild Key, there were so many good things that it came from that after the city of Monona and before that other project that Jesse had involved us with there in the educational system. You know, and I jotted some um, items down here uh, regarding the village of Wanakee and, and where they wanna go from that. And, and, and you can see, even with that dugout canoe journey that we had in 2002, we, long story short, work with Dane County, uh, they gifted us some cottonwood logs. I made a dugout canoe out of that and myself and staff and the youth of the whole chunk people during the height of the pandemic, we made it happen though. And we put a due date, June 20th to the 25th, 2022. We're gonna set that log, whether it floated or not, into the Lake Mendota, right? And we're gonna set sail. I've never paddled a dugout canoe before. Jesse can attest to that. She's watching me, right? For a whole week trying to get that thing straight and narrow on the roads or hot water, right? But in short, if you look in the back pictures of that, we had a safety boat there to assure that our youth, you know, we were relatively safe. But in almost every photo you see Jessie Conway, I hate to pick on her too much on here, sitting in her 
her own kayak back there on her own dime and time out there, sitting right alongside us there to make sure that, you know, and she's an accomplished uh, kayak enthusiast and, and that she's been on many of her waterways. And I asked her first and foremost, you know, how, what's it going to take to get down the Yahara River? I really wanted to start way up there in Six Mile Creek. And she goes, well, you might want to take a look at that. And you'd be all week trying to get down that stream. And in short is what she was trying to allude to, a lot of snakes and such. But what we did with that dugout canoe, based off our recent interaction with the village of Wanakee, they wanted in on that slice of, you know, of opportunity. And we started our dugout canoe journey up there at uh, the village of Wanakee in their park up there. In their, uh, I think it was uh, Six Mile Creek Park or whatever park it is right next to their village hall. And uh, they 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 opened the whole process up, and we we had uh, Ocho Nation representatives up there from the office of the president, myself, and several others there. We had a few minutes, of, you know, with the cameras, but then then it really hit the road. We traveled on down to Lake Mendota, stuck that dugout canoe in there, and we carried it on, and we ended up down there in South Boy, down the Yahara River system through the Four Lakes, and it was a momentous occasion where our Ho Chunk youth and the communities around Madison and folks from all over the states came to enjoy that opportunity of learning experience something. And it started in part because of this village of Wanakee interaction. And I think that's real beautiful because they also stated that uh, they want to gift us uh, something of recognition and they're working feverishly right now to create this artist and item that they're gifting back to the nation. In a short order, I'm gonna ask Marlon to accept this up to our POB. They're excited about that. I got to start talking to his PR officer, uh, Casey Brown, to make that happen. It's coming up shortly. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, there's a lot of things that come from that village of Wanakee process there, too, is that, like I say, people contact us uh, a lot more you know, after each project over here is how can we create those LASs, right, those land acknowledgement statements. You know, can you help us write this? And I often tell them, says, well, it, it shouldn't be our responsibility to write what you want to say but I'll oversee it and I'll, I'll read through it like that to make sure it's proper, short and eloquent, and it has these three major components on it. And then we begin that LSA workup. Uh, there's so many different things, the plaques and recognition and such that takes place, better signage and educational opportunities out there for students to go back and to talk to these communities out there. And what's most important to us is that, uh, just speaking from our tribes, um, the whole chunk nation, you know, we went through those many years of, of Greece, of Greece and, you know, grief and, and simulation, you know, the, the removal process alone for the whole chunk of moon us to no less than four different reservations throughout the states west of the Mississippi. The simulation processes of putting our children through the boarding schools and the mission schools and industrial schools there to try to strip us of our culture, right? You know, and so now you fast forward all the way up to the 60s there where we establish our, our nation as a, as a sovereign entity to be recognized out there, right? From these past treaties that our, our ancestors took the time to sign there to assure that we protect and preserve us as a people in our indigenous areas. Right? And that's, that's where that all comes from. Um, and it was stated on here that, that sovereign sovereignty issue with tribes is that we've never been one to <clears throat> look towards other people to recognize us as a sovereign nation. We have always been a sovereign nation. We always will be a sovereign nation. But in this day and age, we have to play those games out there, that wording processes out there, the land ownership processes. I just listened to my traditional leader, Clayton Winnishick, speak at the Green Corn Dance last night. And he stated, matter of fact, that nobody owns our mother of the earth over here. Uh, we live along her and we live on her. And she gives us uh, what we give, what we get, and, and we hopefully can give back to her in return. Nobody owns our grandmother earth, but in today, well, in society, there's this need to own this square box out there and sign on paper. And he made it very clear that, you know, we still retain our own traditional ways of life, you know, that we still practice is what will get us through, you know, to the next generations of time. And that's why it's so important when we sit here to talk with educational facilities today, how much do we allow our children to come out to and, and assimilate and learn from today's society and yet still retain their culture or impart some of their culture in the process. And that's where this comes right back around in that big circle of life, right? For education is that we want to incorporate into the educational system out here as much as we can offer opportunities for our children to continue to, to live in amongst their own culture, be able to learn a little more about it, whatever way it is, 
uh, working with the University of Madison, for example, Wisconsin Madison, and every university, I should say this, someone stated that, you know, you know, some are and some aren't, you know, as proactive, you know, and but every university system, even in the state of Wisconsin and Illinois, I've been down to the Northwest University several times to speak on different matters. Um, and they all have their, they have their own specific areas of expertise. But you just have to find those niches where they can incorporate tribal opportunities in there. Madison and you know wants diversity. They want tribal members coming across that doorstep, right? And from all all nations out there. Uh, and so we're working diligently, you know, with the Indigenous Awareness Placekeepers uh, Committee, you know, Lakeshore Preserve. Uh, we're working at the capacity of instructors asking us to come in there and to incorporate some cultural awareness, at least from my perspective. I mean, I'm only one portion of, I'm a division of a, one department. We have 12 departments, you know, that have the ability to come there and speak within their own wheelhouse about their expertise and how they assure that our tribal government serves our people, you know, in the best way possible. You know, and, and so there's opportunities out there to reach out to any department of ours if the need fits. I just focus on one little area there. Um, but I allude to the fact that you come to our nation and ask, we're going to try to find a way to help and assist assure, to assure that our youth that are coming into your educational facilities out there has every opportunity possible to know that we support them in their endeavors. Um, we don't we want our children to, to gain higher education to the point where they can come back and help their own tribal communities, how they can help their, their environment, you know, the peoples around them. Um, but we don't we don't force them to do that. So you have to make it lucrative for them to come there. And I look at that, I use the term uh, lucrative for once today. I was trying to use that somewhere. So, uh, but, but that said, you know, the many things that I, I see coming from you know this ability here, you know, it's it's above the dollars and it, it's above you know us you know meeting together. However, it is out there. You know, it's the future. You know. And it's the youth and what I bring back to our tribe, what Marlon brings back to his, you know, administration, you know, that's why he sits here today. I mean, he's a very valuable in, in, individual within our tribe here and to take the time to sit here. That's very important. You know, uh, it su supports us, supports you folks. So that's a big thing. Uh, nothing was mentioned, Jesse, about the Lake Winnebago, you know, rice, you know, interaction of many trees, up, you know, the tribes over there and all the things that we gain from, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, these collaborative, uh, you know, friendships that take place on here. Uh, the indigenous placemakers, we went to the Arboretum, we went to Willow Park, we went to all the different places, even, you know, to the Alumni Park over there to see how we can now include cultural diversity focused on Native American awareness in these areas. And I think that's real big. A decade ago, you've never seen me sitting at Alumni Park looking at that, trying to say, how can I incorporate indigenous awareness in this park? So our tribal members, our tribal you know, youth and their families could come there and sit down there and feel a little more at home in the very place that we alluded to earlier in this discussion here in an indigenous area, Mass and Day Joe, for the Ho-Chunk people. Here there's universities that's on top. They signed this up on Bascom Hill, this land acknowledged the statement. Now I take that document back. And I hold it right in front of everybody and say, this is what you agreed to share with the nation and back and forth. And I use those land acknowledged statements as you agreed uh, to make our collaboration efforts um, take it and take a minute. I'll leave it at that, you know. Okay. <clears throat> Being a geeky, Mr. Quackenbush, good to see you. Good to, he good to hear from you. Good to be together, folks. Um, let's uh, take a minute here to field some questions. Um, thank you, Lisa. Copy that. Uh, Gavin, hi, Gavin, you're back. Yeah, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, Bill, thank you so much um, for being here and presenting. And we're just so grateful for your partnership and uh, everything that you've offered. Um, I, I just wanted to <clears throat> give a little a, a, a addendum uh, to the Wanakee project, because Bill, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but originally the village of Wanakee came to us and said, we want to incorporate the Ho-Chunk Nation into our 150th anniversary celebration. Um, and they want, basically we're envisioning having like a float or something. Um, and to, to Jesse's credit, she was like, if they're really serious about doing this, we're not going to come in and just do one project about how to 
do a nice little float for you know an event they've got to be serious about what we're doing and so to one accuse credit they listened and to what jesse was suggesting what bill was suggesting to say here are all the things that we think could actually be valuable um so i would just say like as as a partner as an interested partner you know local local governments might want to find these kind of surfacey level ways of wanting to incorporate ho-chunk culture into our celebrations but you've got to find a partner who's willing to do the harder work and really dive in um so i don't know i i, I think lisa mckinnon is still on here from dane county so i would say to any local government people looking to do this um you've got to continue to be open-minded and not just look for these kind of surface level ways and then the ho-chunk to their credit we're willing to push back and say no, we don't want to work just on that project. <laughs> we want to work on other projects. Um, also, Jesse was very insistent on saying, is the leadership of the village really involved? Because if they are, we need their leadership to meet with our leadership um, at the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, and so it was, this is more than just like, oh yeah, we did this class, we did a couple of projects, but it was like a, a kind of deep engagement. Um, and I hope it is continued. I mean, obviously the canoe ceremony came there. It's we did the flag raising ceremony, the seal, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I think they've set aside some money in their budget to install some of these cultural markers that we've planned to do together. So anyway, just to add a little context, it's it's not it's not as easy as it might sound, which is one of the reasons why I think some local governments might like the idea of doing it, but aren't necessarily willing to do the work to go to that deeper level. So anyway, just um, thank you, Bill, for hanging in there with them. Yes, um, Gabe and I'll. I'll shadow what, what um, the thought about the, uh, uh, the I think, that, what did they call it there? It was the, uh, the Wanna Boom celebration. Yeah, the Wanna Boom celebration, and, uh, right. We felt it was best for, we created a float there to uh, bring back some of our traditions along this float that didn't necessarily reflect on the flashy aspects of our today's, you know, tribal government or anything. And uh, we thought outside the box and we built a Chipota cake the educational center of our people since time memorial is where we train our you know teach our youth inside the home setting we built a chipotle and pond of trailer and then we placed a traditional drone group in that so that we could once again uh, bring some of our connection to the region there that we can remember uh, since a long time back there the beautiful sounds of the ho-chunks uh, singing in that area and the drum and, and it was well received uh, very well received. Um, it was on a hot day, if I remember, recollect there, and I made the, I've never did parades or nothing like that, and I made the bad mistake of buying chocolate as candy to hand out to children out there, and uh, our uh, our tribal uh, representatives, they were handed it out there, and they were coming back, and they had little chocolate bits, fingers on there, and says, we got to remember to use hard candy next time, and they, but they're handed out just then, but uh, so yeah, so let's learn from that. Uh, we go back and do that once again. We'll think of something a little different next time too. You never want to bring the same float year to year. It's my thought. I've seen floats that blasted like in, so at the Cranberry Fest of Warrens go on for years, decades. You see that same float and you see the same float. So we're going to try to introduce something a little different if we're, we're asking them back once again. So, And I, I think that's a good point, Bill, that like you all ended up doing the Wannaboom celebration but it wasn't just that as the project. We had done all this work before that to say like, okay, yes, we would like to be part of your cultural celebration, but I don't think it was something that would have worked as well if it was just like, yep, all we want to do is incorporate you in a float and that's all the work that we're willing to do. But they actually did yeah. a lot more with you before that. And then you got to the point where like, okay, yeah, we'll join your community celebration. One thing that wasn't mentioned that should be uh, the the the... The, the uh, incorporation of the, the school uh, over there and the, the changing of the mascot. Uh, they, they actually met there. I think Samson Falcon and I both met. He was online. I met, went there and we, they just wanted to get our perspective of what the sensitivity would be of having this warrior-like individual, even though it was called the warriors over there, uh, misrepresented with the stereotypical native image over there. And um, we just stated our case. They took it into their own consideration, and they decided to change that. And that was a big step forward as far as the public educational process on it. So it isn't just university and in the schools, it's communities. Because you know, I know for a fact, oftentimes in communities, there 
that's met with a lot of opposition at times there, but they took the time to address that. And I, we were very grateful for that to take place too. And that's one of those residual things that takes place here too. Good to hear, good to hear. Thank you, Mr. Quackenbush. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Bill Quackenbush? Inviting uh, our participants to uh, join the conversation. If anybody else has a question to ask. If there are no more questions, I just have one comment about Jesse, okay. your background. When is the last time you saw a chalkboard? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, I know I was waiting for someone to comment on that. So thank yeah, you. Right. Thanks for breaking the ice. Yes, thank all you guys for taking the time to listen in on here. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Yes, uh, good to have you. Good, good to be together, folks. Um, we'll, we'll transition then to our next speaker, uh, welcoming in Maria Moreno of uh, Earth Partnership and the Global Health Institute, uh, who is here to share. Uh, we're continuing in this strand of um, sharing uh, insights and experiences about coursework and curriculum development that uh, in partnership with tribal nations and, and tribal colleagues. And so uh, Maria, good morning and welcome in. And turn it to Hi. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. And my colleague, our direct, the director of Earth Partnership, um, and thank you, Jesse, who's also a colleague here at Earth Partnership. Um, Cheryl will not be able to join us, so I will run. Her and I worked on a very nice um, PowerPoint, and I'll show that, share that with you. I also want to just take the opportunity to thank y agradecer all those of you who are out there. You know who you are, who we've been working with for the you know so many years. It's just great to see. Love Bill's uh, presentation. Love Dr. Bang's presentation. She is uh, our advisor for the Indigenous Arts and Science um, of the Earth Partnership um, and has really guide us, guided our program in many ways. But I will share uh, my screen. Um, can you all see this? Uh, let me start the slideshow. Um, okay, of course, this is the last slideshow. It should be the first. Um, okay. Sorry about that. All right. So just um, I'll quickly start. Um, want to thank uh, all of our partners and their seals are uh, on our presentation um, from Bad River, Red Cliff, Black de Plango, Ho Chunk. Um, Menominee, as well as Lakota Ray. Um, so I'm Maria Moreno, I'm with the Department of uh, Planning and Landscape Architecture. I'll be talking about our um, Earth Partnership Indigenous Arts and Science undergraduate education program that we have. Um, and that's, I co-teach these courses with Cheryl Barr Armstrong, who's the director of the Earth Partnership. So the Earth Partnership quickly just started in 1991. Um, at the Arboretum, and we have since moved to the Department of Planning and Landscape Architecture. And the vision there was for communities across the world to be actively engaged in ecological restoration that connect people to the land and each other through a commitment to stewardship. And I think a lot of the picture images that you will see is of youth or families or community members working the land. Um, these are UW students or community partners in Puerto Rico as part of our program there. Um, we have this 10-step uh, process uh, which guides our, course, uh, our courses here at UW, uh, and in terms also uh, we use this in our teacher professional development and even connecting with, um, with our youth in terms of engaging them in restoration um, and stewardship. Uh, and within these, each of these um, topics, there are a number of activities that we use and cater and um, um, sort of uh, focus on activities and the age of the participants. So while they might seem very simple, you can, um, you can sort of up the level depending on your audience. So uh, our, our, I'll move into our Indigenous Arts and Sciences, which started in 2011. And this is a collaboration between tribal partners and the UW-Madison 
that seeks to engage Native youth in culturally based environmental learning and educational pathways. And this is um, the educational pathways has become a really important component of our work in the last few years, because it's not just about um, getting en engaging them in this process of restoration and stewardship and using culturally appropriate um, language and materials, but it's also about you know, moving the pendulum for higher learning and as a result, returning to their communities as um, uh, the president uh, of the Ho-Chunk mentioned and taking over the resources um, and the positions that are uh, in desperate need of community members. So, all right, just wanna give you a sense of where these communities that we work with are which make it, makes it quite challenging uh, because they're not as close as they might seem, even on the map. So, you know, uh, from here to Red Cliff, it's about a five hour drive um, on a good day. Um, Menominee is three hours, three and a half. The Kuduray, I believe, is about a five hour drive um, from Madison. So pre-pandemic, we actually did a lot of our meetings in per well, we did all our meetings in person. Uh, during the pandemic, we were um, very, uh, we just had the opportunity to, you know, with the Zoom capacity um, to work with our partners in more of an intertribal uh, way. But, um, you know, as we're transitioning back uh, this past summer, we did go back to working, doing our teacher institute, our youth programming in the communities. So it's, it's wonderful, wonderful to do that. Um, and you know, be of support and a presence in the community um, of our partners. So I just want to now turning into. I'm going to focus on our Indigenous Arts and Science Big, which is a freshman interest group. But I did want to point out that uh, Earth Partnership does teach a number of classes. We have from LA 363 on restoration education. We have a summer field course um, that in the 2022 was one on indigenous field-based learning for land stewardship on Menominee lands, which I believe Adina Rissman talked about um, quite a bit yesterday. Um, and, I, and I'll just touch on today. We also work uh, with uh, UW Whitewater on this connected to the earth cross-cultural exchange for advanced earth science learning. And that's with Bad River and Red Cliff. And then we do our FIG, which is our freshman interest group. Um, course here at UW and that's strictly for freshmen. And you know, the purpose of, uh, of a lot of what we do and teach is one, to improve native education pathways, collaborate with our uh, land grant institutions um, to support students' academic and research experiences, decolonize courses and curriculum on campus at UW, bring native perspective into the classroom, enhance student learning understanding for community-based work, and also to instill respect and reciprocity for the land community through restoration and stewardship. And this really harks back to what Robin Wall Kimmer talks about very much in her work and which also guides ours. Um, our indigenous arts and science um, is linked with the American Indian studies course and an environmental studies course. And it was created to help uh, students transition um, to, you know, UW uh, and it provides interested, interesting, intimate and interdisciplinary experiences that help students make successful academic and social transition to the university. And I'll share some of um, how we get some of these uh, feedback from students, but we did this word map and this is what came out from our first year. And you can see, um, you know, when, we, when uh, we would ask them for a word after each class in terms of how they, just that what, what came up after the experience of that class. And this is, you know, family, community, history, learning, water, tree, you know, education. So it's, these were the words that sort of resonated the most over the course of those 14 weeks of classes. Um, and then, you know, I, you can get this information, but a whole description of the course that's put out. Um, and then it's, it's uh, linked to these two other courses. Um, which I think in many ways the students say is very complimentary. So here I'm just gonna run you through a few of the things that we do in this big. Uh, to begin with, we have our colleague here, um, Rachel Byington gave a cultural tour to the, to the students. 
And, um, you know, as a, as a way to get them to know our place, get the university that's Ho Chang Kwan. Um, but what was interesting is the students acknowledged that even being in a circle was a new experience that, and that they really value that, you know, who would have thought, you know, just, um, we sat in a circle because it was easier to see and, you know, we just wanted them to see each other and, um, and not be, not have anybody be sort of um, off view from when Rachel was talking. So we try to continue doing this throughout um, whenever we have to speak, we get into a circle. Um, then we also, um, we had a wild rising uh, workshop and this was um, designed by our colleague, uh, Dylan Jennings, who's a, a PA um, doing his PhD at Nelson, but is a PA for the Earth Partnership through the HEAL grant, our uh, HEAL program. Uh, and this was in collaboration with La Couture and Bad River. So they came in and, you know, just wanted, um, so, so we selected the pictures because we wanted to showcase a lot of what the students, the students went through the whole process of, they did not go out and actually harvest the rice. Um, Dylan brought the rice from Bad River, but they went through the whole process of processing the rice, including the actual cooking. So, and um, as you can see the dancing with the moccasins on, and what was interesting about that is that even just putting on the moccasin required two other people to help the student um, put that, put it on and tie it and make sure it was properly on. So, you know, it was very communal. There was a lot of laughter, a lot of conversation, um, and just a lot of learning through doing, um, which is, you know, a big part of our model in this class. Um, and here, uh, kudos to Bill for last week, we participated. This was not part of our class, um, the building of the Chiporque, uh, of the Chiporque which happened in, uh, in front of the Jop uh, residence hall, but we thought we could not miss it, you know, and exclude our student from participating. So our class meets for three, and a, three hours, so we just spent the whole day there. Um, a number of students helped with the actual building of the Chiporque, then some of them participated in um, the basketry um, that happened inside. Um, and then there was also a uh, showcasing of braiding and grinding corn uh, with Dan Cornelius. And, you know, what would, would we have done anything differently? I think the only thing that we would have done was that maybe had the students read a little bit more, of, you know, maybe about corn. We've done the wild ricing, so they knew about that. So the actual cooking of rice and corn that afternoon um, was, you know, very much in par with what we would have done uh, if this was something that was planned. It, we didn't plan it, but it was wonderful and the students loved it. So, you know, thank you, uh, Bill, and thank you to Omar and Catherine Ryland from, for inviting us um, to this event. Um, um, then the other, another one of our uh, wonderful events, and thank you, Bryn, I see that you're in the audience, is seed collection at Willow Creek and preparing for seed sowing. So just a few pictures that show you the process. This, we would meet with Bryn uh, from Lakeshore Nature Preserve and she would <clears throat> introduce what, they're, what they were doing um, at Willow Creek. And I think in this particular day, the students were actually collecting seeds. We took it to, into the classroom and then they cleaned it. Um, so this, this was actually 2021. And then I'll bring you to 2022. Um, this is this year, we're doing the same thing. Um, we actually also went collecting seeds at Holy Wisdom Monastery. And the purpose is to um, is now to clean the seeds, which we will be doing next week. And then it's that that seeding is going to be used. We're going back to Lakeshore Nature Preserve to, um, to you know, plant. This one now, uh, join our uh, seed collection at Holy Wisdom. Um, and as you, I think one of the things that uh, for me looking at these pictures is that the students are all smiling. I mean, it was just these, apart from great weather, beautiful landscape, it, it was just fun. And it was, um, you know, it was an opportunity to talk, to do, to learn, you know, that whole um, environment of everyone just doing something similar but having an experience that was very unique. And um, I, you know, thank to Bryn uh, Scriber from, for the Lakeshore Nature Preserve and the Holy Monastery, uh, Holy Wisdom Monastery for supporting us in, in our efforts to do this. Um, 
So uh, this is the sowing of the seed in 2021. <laughs> so another great picture. Um, and this is what we will be doing on December 6th. We will be taking the seeds that we have after we clean them um, to actually do the sowing at, um, I'm not sure where Bryn will take us, um, but we're open to that. Uh, we have also taken the students to do uh, restoration at the Arboretum, and this is a mound restoration, so just the clearing of evasive species. Um, this, this one, the, the top picture is 2021, and the bottom picture is 2022, and I should tell you that this, um, the students are actually going to be doing a seed um, a listing of seeds for restoration um, of the mound area um, to be and working with uh, Rachel Byington on that, which is our, another colleague of ours. And uh, Adina Rusman did mention of the um, inter-institutional land grants, uh, UW Madison, La Couture Ojibwe University, College of Menominee Nation, uh, and thanks to the data science, which from UW is the data science. Uh, the Institute uh, for Forest and Wildlife Ecology with Adina and Anna Pigeon. I saw Brian earlier um, and Chris. So thank you. This um, We had also Steve Goldstein was another one of the instructors during that week in that great uh, field course at the College of Menominee Nation. And now we're actually planning for 2023, which will take place um, at La Couture Ojibwe University. Um, and this involves students from UW, eight U students from UW, eight students from La Couture, and eight students from College of Menominee Nation. So it's a, it's a New Beginnings funded project um, that allows that uh, so the students can participate in this course. And just to give you a sense of one of some of the things that the students have said, uh, particularly about the big, you know, outdoor places on campus, Experiential learning, favorite part of the class, hands-on activities, real world experiences, overlaps with the material between the three classes. That's, I think that's really important because the American Indian course gives them kind of an overview. And then we just talk about just Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Native American um, tribal communities in Wisconsin. Uh, you know, they bond with the other students, um, personal sense of belonging on campus. And for the rest of my life, you know, uh, yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, made my experience vastly better. Connectedness can get back to the earth. Um, you know, therapeutic. I mean, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever gone um, to collect seeds, but one of those beautiful autumn days that we were out there collecting seeds and just the, you know, the smells and the light because our class was would start at two, but doesn't end until 5.30. So you get that kind of afternoon light and as the, the colors are changing, it's just beautiful. So the students really, I mean, it, it, they would come out of, uh, of, at the end of class, everybody was just so re very relaxed. So it was wonderful to see, but there's a lot of learning. Um, I also forgot to mention that a big part of this fig is we have our native partners uh, also come in and do the um, the teaching. So it's not just us, not, it's not just Cheryl and I, uh, with the possibility of Zoom, some of them have done it in person, but we also just bring them in uh, through Zoom, which is wonderful. Um, and then, you know, I also want, just wanna make sure that we thank our funders. This is part of the Mellon Heal, uh, Heal program, which is the Mellon Grant, uh, the, the New Beginnings and uh, the USDA for Native students and the NSF that allows us to continue working with our partners and thinking of ways to decolonize um, this, this work. Um, so really appreciative. Thank you, Jesse, for inviting us. It's wonderful to share. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you, Maria. Gracias. Good to be together, folks. Uh, let's take a little time to field some questions. If folks have uh, questions they want to ask of uh, Maria Moreno or uh, or Bill Quackenbush, uh, now's a good time. Bring it in, folks. Any questions, comments, suggestions? You know, I also wanted to say that what makes our class so special also is the community component. 
you know, so it's it's almost it's almost a balance. It's not just the the content in terms of the intellectual material, but it's also that connection to community. So you can't have one without the other, if that makes sense. So that you know. Thank you, Maria. Uh, so you've got some comments in the chat, Maria, if you want to check those out. Yeah, no. Brent, thank you. Excellent. Not, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Just wanted to thank Bryn once again. Oh, okay. Thanks for Nature Preserve. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, folks, I think we're uh, we're winding down. Um, I'm going to uh, switch things up here a little bit. I'll go ahead. Um, I think what we'll do, Alessandra, if that's OK with you, um, just kind of do a quick closure here. And then if folks want, do want to stay on uh, for speed networking, um, we can uh, do that and then and then just exit out from there. Uh, Alessandra, do you copy? Yeah. That sounds oh, good. Sure. And Jesse, I'm just going to throw our um, suggested prompts that we had for speed networking in the chat and invite okay. folks to answer them there if you wish. Um, and then okay. we can figure out how to compile them and and um, send them out to everybody. So yeah, that sounds good. So there. why don't you, um, I'm going to give you the floor for a sec, uh, lady. And if you want to just tell us um, what we're going to do for the speed networking, and then I'll do a, a quick close out and then folks can stay on for that if they want to. Okay, Alessandra? Yeah, that sounds good. So I just right. put um, our two suggested prompts in the chat. Uh, so you can go ahead and take a look at those. Um, and yeah, if you have anything to share around those topics, please feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, you can take some time to, to type out your answer and we'll figure out how to circulate every all your answers afterwards. That's all I have. Good. Um, so the network, how does the networking work? Um, how are, how are we going to be doing that? I've never done it before. I'm just oh, here. No, I, I don't think we have time to actually split out into breakout rooms. That was the original plan. Oh, okay. Um, okay. But, but yeah, to kind of do a deconstructed version, I just put the prompts in the chat and see if we can get any uh, engagement there. Oh, oh, just use the chat for it. Got it. Yep. So questions are there. Feel free to answer them uh, if you wish. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. That sounds good. Sorry about that. Okay, folks. Well, um, so yeah, if you're uh, if you're in the chat, um, you can uh, take some time to interact there on some of these prompts. And uh, we would like to uh, stay in touch and continue the conversation. So um, we'll follow up uh, with more information. And so I just in closing, I just want to say uh, thank you to uh, Ho Chunk leadership for joining in today, um, and to each of our speakers who uh, who joined in to share with us and and educate us as we uh, move along our journeys here, decolonizing uh, in our spheres of influence, whether that's um, working in environment or health uh, or administration. Um, see a lot of uh, a lot of representation here from different communities on campus and and in the Dejope area. So I'm um, very grateful to each of you for joining in um, and a special uh, big shout out to the Nelson Institute for uh, <clears throat> supporting this work uh, since 2014 and really helping um, get these initiatives off the ground. Um, it's been uh, um, it's been a big investment, and it's so it's so good to uh, reflect together on steps that were that we have taken uh, in partnering better with uh, more effectively with tribal nations, um, and then also looking forward uh, to uh, seeing uh, the work that has to be done and how other universities are are doing that mm -hmm. work as well, so we can continue to learn from. Uh, both uh, tribal colleagues uh, in in Wisconsin, but also other universities who are aspiring um, to excel in these tribal university partnerships. So uh, very honored to be together today. <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining in and um, I'll wrap up here. And then if you wanna stay on and uh, be, be uh, networking in the chat, that's fine too. <laughs>